Good morning. I am Kenyon McDuffie, at-large council member and chair of the Council's Committee on Business and Economic Development. Today's Wednesday, February 7th, 2024, and we're convening this performance oversight hearing in room 412, virtually via Zoom. The time is 9.36 a.m., and I'm calling to order this hearing. Today marks the committee's second performance oversight hearing, and we're hearing from government witnesses representing the following agencies. Events DC, Destination DC, the Department of Insurance, Securities and Banking, and the Alcoholic Beverage Cannabis Administration. As a reminder, um, actually, we only have government witnesses here, so we're gonna give government witnesses seven minutes to provide oral testimony. Uh, I believe we received written testimony from all four of our agencies. If members uh, join, then they're gonna have an opportunity for opening statement now. If they join after we get started, then they will have an opportunity for rounds of questions. The first entity we're gonna hear from this morning is Events DC. Events DC is the official convention and sports authority for Washington DC. It operates the Walter E. Washington Convention Center, the historic Carnegie Library at Mount Vernon Square, the RFK campus, National Park and the Entertainment Sports Arena. Events DC also promotes and produces some of the district's premier cultural events and activities and supports the district's hospitality and tourism industry with events like the district's Cherry Blossom Festival. Events DC's main source of revenue are conventions, sporting events, and dedicated hotel taxes. With that, I'm gonna call uh, our Events DC witness for this morning, that's President and CEO, Angie Gates. And I'm gonna swear you in before you are seated. Anybody else who plans to testify along with you this morning, if you all wanna raise your right hands before you're seated. You each swear or affirm on the penalty of law that the testimony you're about to provide to the Committee on Business and Economic Development and the Council of the District of Columbia is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, each of you. Be seated. And whenever you're nice and settled in, begin with the testimony. First, I just want to say good morning, everyone, uh, and good morning, Chairman McDuffie. Uh, well, you're in for a treat this morning, so if I have your approval, I would love to first provide you with a year in review uh, video highlighting all the accomplishments at Events DC. As the official host of the nation's capital, Events DC showcases Washington DC as a world-class, family-friendly destination. From Because They're Funny Comedy Festival to Passport DC, we attract, sponsor, and host events in the district that entertain and inspire residents and visitors to enjoy the city. With a portfolio of 11 venues that includes the festival grounds at RFK, the Entertainment and Sports Arena, and the Walter E. Washington Convention Center, we maintain contracts with local business and employ hundreds of residents of the district and surrounding areas. Our work serves as an economic engine to the district as we attract visitors from around the region, nation, and world to attend events, dine in restaurants, stay in hotels, and shop at our local retailers. With various grant and sponsorship opportunities available, we provide benefits back to the district residents and its nonprofit organizations, which elevates everyone. Events DC is committed to a business model that reflects our mission to give back to our community through various social and sustainable measures contributing to the greater good of the District of Columbia and its residents. Our vision stands on these four commitments, that our events entertain, employ, serve as an economic engine, and elevate everyone.
I hope you enjoyed the video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if it's okay with you, I'd like to proceed with my testimony this morning. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie and members and staff of the Committee on Business and Economic Development. I am Angie Gates, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Washington Convention and Sports Authority, also known as Events DC. Thank you for inviting me to testify. Joining me today are Henry Mosley, our Chief Financial Officer, Dr. Steven Johnson, our Executive Vice President, and Nicole Jackson, our general counsel. As the district's official convention and sports authority, our mission is to create unique experiences that result in jobs, economic impact, and lasting memories for residents, tourists, and guests. Our dedicated board of directors ensures the authority meets this mission every day. I would like to take this opportunity to share my vision for the authority and key accomplishments over the past year. My vision stands on four commitments. Our events entertain, employ, serve as an economic engine, and elevate everyone. Every day, I am focused on marketing the district as a destination of choice. As you know, the authority is organized into three core lines of business, the convention and meetings division, the sports and entertainment division, and the Emmy award winning creative services division. We manage 11 venues, including the Walter E. Washington Convention Center, the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Stadium and Campus, the Entertainment and Sports Arena, and Nationals Park. Looking back, I want to acknowledge the September 29th, 2022 cyber attack on our information systems that impacted the completion of our FY22 financial audit. I am ecstatic to report that both the FY22 and FY23 audits have since been completed with no adverse findings, consistent with the clean opinions we have received for over two decades. We have implemented comprehensive cybersecurity safeguards and remain vigilant in defending against threats. In FY23, we hosted 436 events, welcoming over 1 million guests. At the convention center, we held 117 events with over 700,000 guests. Last year, we celebrated the convention center's 20th anniversary and proudly received our LEED Gold Certification for Excellence and Sustainability. As the largest district-owned building in DC, the convention center is a significant contributor to the economic activity downtown. Like you, it is my desire to have our teams stay where they belong right here in DC. And I look forward to serving on the Gallery Place Chinatown Task Force, working to activate this area year round. At the Entertainment and Sports Arena, we hosted 61 events in FY23 with over 100,000 guests. Events DC has a contractual agreement with Monumental Sports at the ESA through 2037. We expect Monumental to adhere to that agreement, but if not, we will work with Mayor Bowser, the council and stakeholders on another course of action. Our commitment to the Congress Heights community is unwavering and we will ensure the campus continues to thrive. Collectively, our operations resulted in a net economic impact of over $450 million in FY23. This revenue helps fuel our hotels, restaurants, workers, businesses, and so much more. In FY23, we distributed over $10 million to DC cultural institutions and community organizations in all eight wards. 
in FY24, we are implementing the fourth phase of DC CARES program, providing $20 million in financial assistance to excluded workers. We continue to engage our community stakeholders with outreach and signature programming in all eight wards. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for joining us at the Thanksgiving Feast of Sharing at the Convention Center, where we served over 5,000 meals to neighbors. In conclusion, Events DC remains committed to the district's success as a tourism and hospitality destination with world-class people delivering world-class events. I want to thank Mayor Bowser and the council for your steadfast support and the Committee on Business and Economic Development and you, Chairman McDuffie, for your strong leadership. This concludes my testimony. I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony this morning. I do have some questions on Events DC's performance. Thank you for the video as well. Um, as has been the case in, in the past, um, I like to begin uh, agency performance oversight hearings uh, talking about the work that um, both district government agencies and quasi agencies or entities affiliated with our government are doing around racial equity. Uh, as we think about all the things that have transpired over the last uh, three, three and a half years, uh, it's been challenging for a number of individuals, families, businesses, both small and large, uh, as well as uh, for workers across District of Columbia, both public sector and private sector. Uh, what in Events DC's work uh, might you want to share with respect to how you all are approaching um, racial equity uh, when it comes to grants and other community-based organizations that really, I think, have their finger on the pulse of the happenings, the conditions uh, in communities across the district of Columbia, particularly those that are in need of the sorts of supports and services that come along with the grants that you all provide. Thank you so much for that question, Chairman. Uh, racial equity is at the forefront uh, of our day-to-day -day activities. And I'll just start with our workforce and our employment at Events DC. Uh, we've made sure and to make it a point to maintain equitable and to do whatever is necessary to sustain our employment at Washington DC by making sure people are back at work, getting paid a fair share uh, to do what's necessary to bring tourism and hospitality to our nation's capital. Outside of our workforce and our employment, uh, we also, you touched on community grants. We distribute over $500,000 annually in community grants to help bridge that racial equity concern. Uh, we think that it is very important. It not only helps our adults, but it helps our, our youths, particularly with our community grants program, and it makes an impact and a difference. But we don't stop there. The third would be through our contract and procurement process. I, I, I know that uh, CBE is very important to you and SBE, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I just have to first give a shout out to our contract and procurement team and the importance of what is necessary to make sure that we're funding those small businesses and those local businesses so they have an opportunity to employ, uh, preferably district residents, and give them an opportunity to live, work, and play in the District of uh, Columbia. In addition to that, with our community grants, uh, we are servicing all eight wards, uh, and, and we make it a point to especially those businesses that are on the brink of potentially becoming a CBE, we give it an opportunity to connect them with DSLBD so they can be an entrepreneur or a soon to be working business here in our nation's capital. Um, in the responses to the committee's pre-hearing questions, uh, identify community grants to youth programs and sports is one of the things that you brought up and uh, you touched on it. 
Uh, a little bit in the response you just gave, I'd love for you to expand on what those grants have done for youth sports in the District of Columbia. I have um, really uh, encountered a number of individuals and uh, others who are affiliated with organizations across District of Columbia um, who talk about the need, particularly as we think about how we address violence, the response to violence, uh, on the opportunity side of addressing violence, that we create more pathways for young folks to engage in sports. Now, let me be clear, for all my folks who are in the arts and the, the sports isn't the only thing we want our young folks doing. We want them exposed to uh, really a, a well-rounded opportunities um, that includes the arts. Um, and I have a follow-up question because there was a woman, uh, I think her name was Kimberly Gaines, who testified uh, at our hearing that we had for public witnesses uh, on the work that she's doing with her steel band and all the young folks who she's engaging. Uh, we had a really um, a lively, spirited, positive uh, exchange uh, during the hearing because of the work that she's doing. And so uh, talk about the sports, talk about just y'all's opportunities to really support organizations that are engaging, creating pathways for young folks, engaging that sort of structured activity. Uh, and then maybe uh, after that, if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the ways that you all are also supporting I think really important organizations that are exposing young folks to maybe um, some types of activities that don't always, they don't always get exposed to in their schools or in other places that are more traditional uh, in communities. Thank you for that question. Uh, as the official sports uh, commission here in Washington, D.C., sports remains on the forefront. I want to go back and talk a little bit on the community grant side. Uh, the steel band east of the river is amazing uh, with Miss Gain. And not only the work that they do from the instrumental musical side, but it's particularly that after school type of programming that occurs from three to eight, and they take it a step further and provide transportation um, from the Episcopal Church to and from the youth's homes. So uh, that is important. Uh, and we did 500,000 annually last year through our community grants that focus strictly on youth. Um, sports is the primary focus along with um, arts and culture, but we're gonna up that amount thanks to the support of the board that is gonna go from a $500,000 half a million investment annually to a 250,000 uh, addition. So you're talking about $750,000 investment. Right. Uh, last year, we distributed about 52 community grants across all eight wards, but that makes the, the difference in getting our youth uh, engaged in something that they're passionate about. Um, being on the field and having, helping with those particular skill sets are key, but also what happens off the field. We also work closely with our, uh, the fields at RFK uh, through our program with Chris. 70% of the rentals that take place uh, at the fields at RFK are 70% is strictly sports okay. related. And to take it a step further, we also provide opportunities if there's some financial assistance needed in order to access those fields. We provide waivers as well, and, and applicants can apply to get a waiver to offset that Fin those financial costs. Uh, we uh, do signature events at Events DC. So we have a day of play uh, that we do annually. And it's typically when a lot of the youth are, you know, out for spring break, we typically host uh, an event over at the fields at RFK uh, to bring people together, not only to focus on the sport itself, but a health and fitness way uh, of living as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I love to. I'm. I'm glad to hear about the additional two hundred fifty thousand dollars that the board has authorized uh, for these purposes. Um, just really having conversations uh, like the ones that I've had with the people who signed up to testify at the public hearing, but also just others who I encounter uh, in my travels across District of Columbia, supporting uh, local high school, middle school, mm -hmm. um, you know, in some cases elementary school sports. Um, whether it is you know, our DC public schools, our charter schools, independent schools, there's a lot going on right now mm -hmm. and it's positive to see. I'm also excited about uh, some of the work that um, some of the other DC agencies are doing in terms of expanding those opportunities to, to sports for girls in, in things like wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't even aware until I was, I was informed that um, DC SAA was doing work with uh, some of the schools around 
uh, wrestling for girls, which I think is just, you know, um, just one more way that we are ensuring uh, the enforcement and and the really important work around Title IX and the District of Columbia, creating those opportunities across genders for the types of activities that I think augment, support, provide the types of values that I know are important to, to you, the mayor and this administration, members of the council, uh, that are really DC values that I think are shared across demographics in all parts of the city uh, that play out when you have these types of activities. So I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this because I, I thought it was really important. I know how important it is to you and the work that you all do at events. And you mentioned charter schools. Uh, we also work with the charter schools as well and schools sure. without uh, school without walls uh, is also someone we work closely right. with, um, particularly at the at the fields. Right. Um, and to your, your point um, with the, the women's sports, we've even made it a point to continue to focus on that in our sports and entertainment mm -hmm. division. Uh, we have to make sure just like you talked about being equitable and bridging that racial equity, we got to do the same thing with, with sports, mm -hmm. you know, men's sports, women's sports, what we're invested in has to be equitable from a sponsorship and partnership perspective as, as well. And so we're, we're taking that same equitable approach with the things that we promote and, and help elevate as I'm well. Glad to hear that. Um, you mentioned in your testimony, um, a little about uh, the ESA and, and one of our sports teams to, to remain in the District of Columbia. So while Events DC does not operate Capital One Arena, uh, Monumental Sports' is potential move may have some implications for the entertainment sports arena. I asked this in the committee's pre-hearing responses, um, but if you have any updates uh, regarding the, the Mystics, um, the Go-Go, or, or anything else you want to share with the public, I'm happy to hear. I know you touched slightly on it, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to expand if there's anything else you want to share about that. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I uh, am super excited. You know, the Entertainment and Sports Arena is the home of the Mystics and the home of the Go-Go. And that is exactly where uh, we continue to have the Mystics in, in the Go-Go call home, the Entertainment and Sports Arena. Uh, there's a contractual agreement that's in place with Monumental that goes through 20 37, uh, and we expect for them to adhere to that. Now, with that also being said, we have a due diligence on our part from a business operations standpoint to continue to invest, uh, diversify our entertainment portfolio at the entertainment and sports arena. Uh, we are looking to do a signature event on an annual basis there, but also do events to continue to engage the community. When you talk about building that equity gap, the entertainment and sports arena just being there created jobs, created you know opportunities. Uh, we have a program that we're going to be uh, launching uh, in 2024, uh, the Events DC Academy, and the entertainment and sports arena is the perfect platform to utilize that for sports training. Uh, in endorsement type discussions, marketing from a sports perspective. Uh, but we will continue to work with Monumental as we have in the past, and we will continue to engage and uh, keep that calendar uh, busy as well. Great. Um, any recent conversations or communications with Monumental uh, since the announcement of the potential move to Potomac Yards? So Events DC is the, the landlord and Monumental is our tenant. So we've continued Got to it. dialogue just as a standard business operation practice. Uh, we haven't had a specific conversation like negotiation related uh, regarding the announcement. Um, but our expectation is for them to continue not only to fulfill uh, their obligations from a contractual perspective, but to fulfill the community obligations as well. Right. And we mentioned the, the mystics and the go-go. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, the Wizards practice at the facility? Yes, the practice facility is there as well, and their office is uh, located at the Entertainment and Sports Arena. Got it. Okay. And another thing that we're looking to uh, continue to elevate, and it's coming actually coming up in a few days, uh, is the boxing opportunity uh, also at the Entertainment and Sports Arena. We have uh, Davis Boxing coming up as well. So okay. we want to continue to have it activated with the title that stated the Entertainment and Sports Arena. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, you uh, both in your responses to the committee's pre-hearing questions, and this is specifically, I think, question number 40, you provided some KPIs, um, uh, and one of which caught my eye. 
I know you also mentioned um, in your testimony uh, a number of events um, associated with the different facilities, which is which is great to hear. Um, but generally, the the trend between fiscal year 2022 and fiscal year 2023 was up, but events at St. Elizabeth's East in particular appear to have dropped mm -hmm. from 233 in 2022 to 206 in 2023. Uh, to what do you attribute that? Rob? So uh, during that period of time, I think that was when we were going back, uh, dealing with uh, some additional promoters uh, to remind them of the importance of doing entertainment across east of the river as well. Uh, and we have a signature signature venue mm -hmm. uh, at the entertainment and sports arena. We do have to be mindful of the season. Um, and sometimes there were a conflict in dates uh, with booking availability with tours uh, that conflicted with season dates as well. But that is also why we're looking to uh, diversify the portfolio in such a way where we're utilizing the arena like for day events, uh, in addition to not just evening events. Got it, got it. And, and looking at your answers to question 42, uh, both the Convention Center and St. Elizabeth East have not fully recovered to pre-pandemic levels for events. Um, what kinds of projections do you have for fiscal year 2024 for these uh, facilities? Do you expect the number of events to continue climbing back towards fiscal year's 19 levels, or, or have you already seen a plateau, plateau for those things? I, I would not say plateau. Um, we are continuing to see uh, an increase uh, in events. We're not exactly where we were prior to the pandemic, but even when we did our original forecast in 23, we exceeded uh, the number that was forecasted. So we expect that number to continue to, to climb. Uh, we don't anticipate um, a drop or a, a decrease, uh, but we're getting there. We're, 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 we're getting there. Okay. Uh, and and what other types of uh, activations or, or events? You mentioned a marquee event. I'm I'm not sure um, whether you're speaking specifically to the ESA, but, but what other types of things do you anticipate happening at the ESA um, uh, over the next year, uh, specifically? specifically this fiscal year? So specifically this fiscal year, we're gonna do some additional cultural uh, inter style entertainment. Okay. Um, one of the things that uh, is a long-term vision that we're preparing for in 2025, mm -hmm. uh, but we're gonna do a prelim to that in 2024. Uh, there's so much musical history uh, with Blue and uh, several main street, you know, Go-Go is, as you know, the, the uh, legislation and thank you again for doing that legislation to have go go as the official music of washington dc uh we're going to continue to uh, look at elevating that culture and that music uh with a go go and culture festival um we're pre we're preparing now to do an official launch in 25 but we're going to do some um, preliminary events there also uh looking at engaging our youth uh through gaming uh we are looking to do uh some, a gaming event that will engage particularly our youth as well as students in charter schools in uh, dc public schools as well so gaming uh is is really big as well and the way the entertainment and sports arena is infrastructured and outfitted we're preparing to do a gaming event in 2024 um and also thinking about um the esa and uh, all the potential and uh, for for 2024 um what kinds of conversations do you have just generally speaking, I would think you have conversations with folks like uh, at Dempad mm -hmm. about Sycamore and Oak. I know Katrina Owens has been doing a wonderful job uh, over there. All the black owned businesses at Sycamore and Oak. I, I always thoroughly enjoy my time when, I, when I'm over there, both because of the, um, the types of things you can purchase uh, mm -hmm. from the shops, the types of foods you can get. Uh, from the vendors there uh, and the types of activities that they're programming for Sycamore and Oak. So, so 
Uh, how, how does that factor into some of the things that you all think about in ESA? Is there any coordination between the two in terms of events? Actually, I, I talk quite often to uh, Monica Ray in that yeah. team. Um, I just bought a shirt over there the, uh, the, <laughs> from the Black Phone store. Uh, and you don't have to take it and not only promote it in D.C., but outside of D.C. Um, but I often uh, chat with uh, Monica Ray. We just recently talked about uh, possibly starting to do a film uh, series uh, over in, in the Sycamore Warren Oak. Uh, I think uh, what is important and what's key is to continue to take those incubator mm -hmm. businesses, uh, elevate them, use our marketing resources at Events DC and some of those other opportunities where we can expand and do bigger events at ESA as well. Now, I appreciate you mentioning Monica Ray. I uh, had a number of conversations with her um, and really appreciate sort of uh, the model that they are, are um, utilizing over there, the support that they're providing to those black owned businesses um, as they continue to, to do the work that they're doing at those shops. And so I um, want to keep people excited and energized about what's going on over there. And really, you know, I know it's not y'all's job, but uh, <laughs> any support uh, that ties into the stuff that, you know, Monica Katrina and folks are doing at, at the Sycamore and Oak with things that are happening at uh, ESA, I think is important. Because when I go to games, there's always a lot of energy on mm -hmm. both places. And so I think um, the coordination to the extent that has happened, it sounds like you all are, are having great Yes, and it's really a destination opportunity. Right. Uh, you know, you have not only the uh, sports side of it, but the culinary component, you know, as you mentioned, the fashion component, uh, and that's just right there made in D.C. So uh, it has to continue to be a collaborative effort, a continued discussion, and making sure that we get people, you know, coming across all late wards. Um, I'm working with Because They're Funny as well. That's uh, one of the signature events that okay. we la uh, launched mm -hmm. uh, with Events D.C., working with Nice Crowd, and actually they provided testimony. But that was an opportunity for us to elevate um, comedians of color. And when we look at the history of the comedian and that comedic scene here in Washington, D.C., and the touch points that tie directly into that Congress Heights Ward 8, you know, community. We just recently had a chance about doing masterclass uh, to help elevate. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, you know, I, I have to put on record uh, because they're funny actually was named one of the top 10 new festivals in the country oh, okay. uh, last year. And we, you know, launched that right here in, in Washington, DC. That's excellent. That's excellent. I'm so glad to hear it. I think um, as we think about performance for some of the other agencies that touch on what's happening at ESA, uh, that entire campus at St. Elizabeth is extraordinarily important. And, and the things that uh, DEMPED uh, is working on on the St. Elizabeth mm -hmm. campus in terms of further development of that campus, projects that help support it, some of the housing, obviously, that's there and, mm -hmm. and will be there. Um, you know, uh, some of the other things that I think uh, are, are under consideration for that site. I know when you think about events or concerts, boxing and the like, some people, to be candid, um, you know, they look at uh, the wharf mm -hmm. and uh, Anthem because of all the amenities there. Um, and I think it's important to make sure people understand the investments that are to come of uh, the St. Elizabeth's campus uh, that will support the activities that are happening there. Um, uh, beyond Dempit, thinking about DSLBD and some of the things mm -hmm. that need to happen um, and that Main Street along um, Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue uh, and Malcolm X, uh, where you have those small businesses. I've heard and talked to some of the small business owners there who don't really feel that the things occurring on the campus necessarily flow mm -hmm. uh, in terms of spin, you know, mm -hmm. uh, patronage uh, of those businesses along Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. And so uh, as we think about this, uh, you know, what, what needs to happen about downtown, places like Gallery Place, let us not forget about the importance of supporting, um, uh, which I know we, we, we are concerned with, um, the business activity, the residents um, that, that are along the corridors along Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. Uh, and Chairman, as you uh, mentioned that, uh, there are two things that instantly come to mind. Uh, uh, I'm sitting on the Gallery Place uh, Chinatown Task Force. And so interesting enough, things that we're talking about from an activation standpoint uh, in the downtown corridor, are directly applicable to activating that MLK corridor. Um, when I think about art all night, 
mm -hmm. and the level and the robust of activities that take place during all, all art all night along that MLK corridor. That's something that we can look at activating. And I will make it a point to work with uh, DSLBD and the deputy mayor's team to look at other activations throughout the year that we can uh, do that. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, let's talk about uh, Nats Park uh, and a little bit about sports wagering. Uh, what's the status of the scoreboard project at Nats Park? Uh, and um, if you can, I don't know if you have the number specifically, but what's the district's contribution to supporting that, that scoreboard project? Uh, it's done. <laughs> well, it, it, I should say it's done from the perspective that um, we did uh, do a financial investment. And I do want to provide a little bit of clarity. I think uh, originally it was stated it was around a 22 or $20 million investment. It was closer to a $16.2 million investment. And I have to commend uh, the Nationals and the entire team. Uh, we were able to secure a state-of-the-art uh, scoreboard. Uh, the fans are going to enjoy but we've already uh, completed uh, the financial aspect of that process. And it's been very great uh, working with the Nationals uh, team and just focusing on the fan experience at Nationals Park. Okay. Uh, and I know, um, uh, I think sometimes people think about the impact of sports wagering. I have oversight of the uh, office lottery and gaming. Um, and there's a lot of talk about what's happening at the different arenas, mm -hmm. uh, whether you're talking about Capital One, uh, Audi Field. Um, you all have a, a particular relationship with Nats Park, and I think mm -hmm. sometimes things get conflated, but is there anything that Events DC does with respect to um, sports wagering that occurs in Nats Park uh, that uh, Bet MGM runs? Actually, uh, we don't play a role in the sports wagering aspect of that. Uh, all of that is exclusively handled uh, by the Nationals management team. I think it's important for the public to really understand that. I know we've had some people who raise certain types of questions about um, the, the, the industry, the program, and, and, and look at the fact that there is that unique relationship between Events DC and Nats Park and sometimes think that it bleeds over into the work around sports wagering. But thank you for clarifying that for the record. Thank you. Um, what's happening with the retail development along First Street Southeast next to the stadium? Um, do you all have any sort of timeline of when to expect uh, some of that work to be completed? I know it may have been last year um, when we were here, you talked a little bit about some of the things happening around the convention center and that retail. I'd love to hear any updates around what's occurring on First Street along Nats Park? I'm almost at the point to say we're done, no, but not quite there. <laughs> um, a lot of progress has uh, been made. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we, as uh, soon as I stepped into this role as president and CEO at Events DC, I probably talked to Gregory McCarthy twice a week. <laughs> but uh, specifically to talk about First Street Retail, uh, the board of directors at Events DC uh, was just as invested to make sure that we could get that up off the ground. So we did a investment of $3 million to help with the infrastructure of First Street Retail. Uh, we're still the, you know, although we're the landlord and uh, the nationals are the, are the tenant, they will be overseeing uh, the First Street Retail uh, process as far as getting tenants uh, available and ready to get started and going at that particular location. Uh, with that being said, and what I'm super excited about, we made it a point to uh, get engaged and work in partnership with the Nationals because we had to fulfill the Zoning Commission requirement for that 17,000 square feet. We had to uh, fulfill a a particular build out by a deadline. And what I'm extremely ecstatic to say, and I have to give a shout out to the general counsel, uh, is we were able to finally get our certificate, our permanent certificate of occupancy. Uh, so in 2008, uh, we've been, you know, working from the temporary occupancy perspective, but we were able to get that uh, solidified. Uh, I'll turn it over to the general counsel, see if she would want to add anything regarding First Street You retail. just state your name for the record, so we have it. Sure, Nicole Jackson, general counsel for Events DC. Oops, Nicole Jackson, general counsel for Events DC. Um, yeah, I would re reiterate what, uh, uh, President Gates said we were very ecstatic to finally get our permanent certificate of occupancy at the ballpark. Um, the Nats are working through, um, they've, I think, recently just received their building permit to uh, start the construction on the First Street retail site. They do have 
uh, one tenant, X Golf, which I believe they announced uh, a month or so ago, will be their first uh, retail tenant, and they are working on the other one. So we hope it, they'll be doing the build out uh, over the next um, few months, and we'll, we'll hopefully uh, have that space begin to be activated um, in the in this fiscal year. Sounds good. Thank you for that update. And Chairman, you mentioned briefly uh, our retail at the convention center, our yeah. streetscape uh, retail. We're, one of the things I'm also excited about at Events DC is our investment in uh, like startup businesses as well. We have uh, four tenants that we're working with on our streetscape initiative, which is really our incubator approach uh, with businesses. And so we have gotten very far further along with that project as well. Um, one of the tenants, the gentleman closet, is uh, currently open on the streetscape side. I do want to give Dr. Johnson uh, an opportunity because that's one of the projects that he's working on. And if you can make sure you just state your name for the record. Yes, good morning, um, Dr. Stephen G. Johnson, Executive Vice President. Um, as President Gates stated, we're very excited in regards to our strategic initiatives, working with the projects with these small businesses. Uh, we're very, um, I'm diligent about making sure that we not only just give these uh, small businesses an opportunity, but also we've been helping them um, in regards to some of the barriers that they have experienced in regards to the permitting process. So we anticipate that the three additional um, small businesses incubators will be occupying the space um, near the, the um, at the Walti Watch Convention Center, um, and we're very excited. One will be DC Pie, and another will be um, a Saibo. Um, Place. I'm really excited about that. Thank What's you. the other one? The uh, acai bowl? Yes. Oh, okay. Oak, Oakberry. Oh, Oakberry. Okay. They didn't have a acai. Well, I got you. I got you. Yes. <laughs> It's because he eats acai all the time. Not, my, my daughters are fans. That. My daughters are fans of it too. And you know, I don't know if I all the rave, but you know, let's go with it. Um, let me ask about RFK. Actually, before I do that, I know um, we talked about sports earlier, but as I think about the convention center and just some of the activities that I witnessed firsthand um, last year, it was any number of reasons to be there just because there's so many activities, uh, events that are occurring there. Um, but I know there has been some efforts. We talked about sports earlier. I, I skipped over this question, but I thought it was important for me to go back to ask it. Um, how, if at all, have you all thought about attracting, you know, really big, marquee events um, at the convention center. I guess thinking along the lines of things like the, the high school, McDonald's All-American game, some of the, the, the Nike, uh, you know, elite youth basketball league, EYBL, which is huge and is popular. I know there are things that are happening in places like Chicago and mm -hmm. other folks uh, have these convention centers that are buzzing uh, in the spring and in the summer with these types of uh, marquee events that is attracting thousands of people, mm -hmm. not only in the convention center, but also to the hotels um, surrounding the, their convention centers, to all the restaurants and shops uh, located in and around their convention center. So how do you all think about that sort of um, level of events? And, and, and are you all working to try to like promote, attract those types of marquee events to the district? Uh, absolutely. Um, one of the things, uh, and we talked about our three lines of business convention and meetings and sports and entertainment, but when I look at the 11 venues in our portfolio and look at the convention center, it is just as important to di diversify uh, what we're hosting there, uh, as you mentioned. When you look at a citywide convention or you look at one of these large sporting events, you're absolutely right. They're filling our hotels, they're keeping our restaurants busy, and typically with these uh, sporting events and particularly, the entire family is coming. If someone is uh, you know, on the court, you have the entire family. It's typically the parents, the grandparents, aunts, uncles. So you're bringing in about five or six people to one uh, particular event. So we have to continue uh, to uh, look at those uh, sporting opportunities. Uh, and coming up, actually, this month, we have the volleyball uh Classic coming up. I, I mean, it's, it's huge. It's, I mean, it's huge. I think it's over 900 teams in, involved. And so it's, it's also an opportunity to uh, further indicate why the convention center is one of the top convention centers in North America and that we have the capability of hosting your top conventions, but also bringing in uh, these sporting opportunities that 
an entire family can enjoy. Okay. I know um, one of the things I got to see up close and personal um, with some of your team as well was, uh, I think you and I actually maybe walked the facility before uh, it began, but the uh, the USJN, I think it's US Junior Nationals mm -hmm. Basketball uh, Championships mm -hmm. uh, came back to the DC uh, mm -hmm. last year, which was great. I, I believe they, they should be back Mm -hmm. NBC at I think it was in April. It was April 11th okay. is the date that we're looking at. Okay. Um, and I think uh, you were blown away when you came, you know, yeah, to, to yeah. visit. The, but basketball tournaments, uh, in particularly elevating those opportunities, it's also preparing these athletes to be in a, a big setting. Uh, and we're also looking at the entertainment and sports arena uh, on the collegiate side, primarily. Um, we just did something uh, or something's coming up with uh, Georgetown and UConn, or we just finished something with Georgetown in, in UConn. Yeah, I think that was the, was that the women's basketball? Uh-huh, women's. I mm -hmm. only missed it because I was out of town with my daughter at another tournament. Okay. So we, we had our eyes set on that game and I was excited that you all were hosting that at the yes. USA. Yes, okay. and it goes back to that equitable component, making sure that we're elevating the women's, you know, basketball and women's sports just in general. But the convention center, uh, as we said, is the largest district building, you know, here in Washington, D.C. And so for us, anytime there's an opportunity to just diversify, even the, you know, having um, events going on consecutively, we recently had the Washington Auto Show, for example. Yeah. And uh, I was uh, proud to say that I was uh, able to work with the team and we brought in the crew of Pyros, uh, which is a Mardi Gras crew okay. that highlights Louisiana culture. But, you know, we had to put a little mumbo sauce on there, exactly. and, you know, have Belladonna perform and Raheem Devon. But a prime example of that is to have the facility primarily used for the auto show, but then to bring in something different mm -hmm. like like this huge uh, Mardi Gras ball, which, you know, also added to the hotel stays. Yeah. So we're going to uh, we, we talk about that very often uh, and we're going to continue to focus on those sports opportunities as well. That. I think it's a, a bit repeating. Um, when you think about the impact, uh, and you touched on this, when you know kid comes for uh, you know volleyball or basketball, or some other sport, uh, then generally they come with a family, right, mm -hmm. and and multiple generations of family. Um, and I think that one of you know things that are unique to the district is uh, they aren't just coming to go to that one event. You know, you have monuments, you have the mall. Uh, you have all the theaters. You have so much more that makes the District of Columbia attractive. I think more attractive than a lot mm -hmm. of other cities mm -hmm. in that respect. Um, and so you make a vacation out of it mm -hmm. uh, when you come to those types of events. One of the uh, tournaments I also think you were referencing was the uh, ADG Mo the Moneyball tournament as well, which was very successful, uh, which was very successful. Let me note um, that we've been joined by at-large council member um, who's uh, joined the committee for this oversight here, and Christina Henderson, welcome. Uh, we'll turn to you for a round uh, shortly. Um, I wanted to um, just ask a little bit about uh, excluded workers and, and thank your team for working with uh, my team here at the committee mm -hmm. um, to ensure the timely processing of the in-progress relief for excluded workers. I understand that the funds are now with the Community Foundation. Talk that about correct. that and how, how the process uh, has been going since um, the money's gotten out of the door. Uh, thank you for that that question. Uh, you're, you are correct. Um, we are participating in the DC CARES for excluded workers. Um, we received the $20 million uh, that has been uh, transferred to the Greater Washington Community Foundation. It's going to impact maybe about 15,000 or so excluded workers. Uh, and for phase four, I think the estimated disbursement per person is around $1,400. Uh, the Community Foundation is working with about five other nonprofits. Uh, we still have the database through one of the nonprofits to make sure that there can be a direct touch point. I'll turn it over to my uh, general counsel to further elaborate with where we are in the process. Uh, thank you, President Gates. Yeah, we, we're we we're making great progress on um, implementing phase four as uh, President Gates mentioned we have transferred the funds to the Community Foundation. They are working with additional partners to um, 
begin the outreach to the excluded worker community, which, as we said, was about 15,000 um, people. Uh, they are hiring folks to help do the processing and distribution. Um, we, we are on a similar time frame as we have been in the in the past three rounds. So we expect the funds to start making their way to folks and the distribution to start um, probably in the spring. It'll probably take several months to reach all 15,000 folks. Um, it may go faster depending on, uh, on on how many folks they can bring on board to, to assist, but we are uh, pretty much on the same time frame as we have been in the, in the past. So we're, we're excited to, to get this moving and get this money out the door. Thank you for that. Uh, let me turn to uh, Councilmember Henderson for a round. Um, thank you, Councilmember McDuffie, um, and good morning. Good morning. Well, not on this committee, but all of these agencies have relevance mm -hmm. uh, to all the work <laughs> that I I think is super important about the district and 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 the work that we do. Um, I I want to ask and sort of talking if you go back up just a little to explain the process around when you all start planning or bidding out for conventions. So for instance, I imagine that the calendar for 2025 is already stocking up, 2026, I'm not sure. I'm just curious, like usually how far out in advance are you all getting inquiries about using space? As far out as, as possible. So we don't have a uh, limited uh, window where we stop uh, taking um, uh, inquiries uh, or doing bookings. Um, I think we probably have stuff booked out of like 20, 30 something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's not like a cutoff period. Okay. So that's a great in terms of just trying to, for under, for people to understand mm -hmm. that, you know, they're living in 2024, but you all are already operating in terms of thinking about what does 2028 look like, what does 2029 look like, et cetera. And we and we have to, um, you know, I'm convinced that Washington D.C. is the best place to host anything, <laughs> whether it's convention and meeting, sports and entertainment, or a, a creative event. Um, but we start we once we got past like that pandemic period, and even then we were having conversations, you know, for years years later. Um, but we are often competing with other cities, so these conversations, especially on your larger citywide uh, events, because it's not just about the building itself, the convention center. What we also have to factor in is the hotel rooms and making sure, you know, the hotel rooms are blocked. And so it's it's a bigger conversation than just the, the facility itself. And so we work closely uh, with Destination DC, uh, who you will be hearing from uh, later later today. But this process, I mean, we, we go far out as possible. Okay. Um, yeah, I have some questions for Destination DC as, as well. Um, and I've I think, told someone on your team, I'm I, I personally want to get some of these fraternity and sorority conventions back um, mm -hmm. because they keep saying DC, but it's Washington Harbor. It's like National Harbor. Right. And I'm like, that's not actually DC. That's cute, but it's not. <laughs> um, and so as we start thinking out in some of these meetings, that's, that's important. Um, and I'm but, in full support of that mm -hmm. as I'm in full support of that as well. Uh, and, and Dr. Johnson, uh, and not only those bigger, uh, conferences and conventions, these ancillary events are just as important too. Right. Right. Um, let me ask some questions about the entertainment and sports arena. Mm -hmm. How many events did they have in 2023 outside of bass, uh, outside of, um, hosting the mystics? Um, we had in 2023 for the entertainment and sports arena, let's see if this is right, two, well, this covers the St. Elizabeth's campus of 206 collectively. I want to say at the entertainment and sports arena specifically, it was closer to about 65 or 61 um, for 2023. So okay, so when you say the St. Elizabeth's campus... What that includes are, is that includes? that also we also on St. Elizabeth's campus we have the Rise Demonstration right. Center, and in addition to the Rise Demonstration Center, we also have Gateway Pavilion. Gateway Pavilion, being that it's an outdoor facility, uh, that's used more often, of course, during the spring and and summer months. The Rise Demonstration Center is used, you know, year round. Uh, there's a heavy uh, community uh, right. participation, uh, especially on the economical side as well with the use of the Rise Demonstration Center. Okay. Have there been any limitations in, I guess, booking more for ESA? I wouldn't say limitations, but what I, what I would 
describe, um, coming from venue management, um, I was the former uh, general manager at the Warner Theater and at Sanger Theater. When I joined Events DC, one of the things that uh, was strictly uh, of uh, utmost importance was to look at the economics, uh, things like the production side of it, and I'll let Dr. Johnson speak to this as well, uh, load in, like what mm -hmm. it takes to load in an event, what it costs to load out an event, because we are the home of the mystics and the go-go, making sure that floor is protected. So things that you may not traditionally have to uh, interface with when you're preparing for a concert or preparing for an event like floor covering, we have to we had to factor in. So just recently we did an assessment to look at how we can make like load in and load outs more economical. Also diversifying the type of events that we're doing. It mm -hmm. is the entertainment and sports arena, but we don't want to limit it to just sports act sports activities right. uh, gaming is another great opportunity along with boxing is another great opportunity uh, i just shared earlier we have a boxing davis boxing <laughs> uh event coming up in the next week or so uh, also uh utilizing the space uh for any type of filming opportunities so we're going to have to look at diversifying the portfolio uh, let me give dr johnson an opportunity just to add with some of the additional assessments that we're doing okay All right. thank you president gates um, as president gates stated um, at esa uh, we're we're um, making investments in um, esa to make sure that we're competitive we've been looking at uh, spaces such as um, the anthem as well as eagle bake arena and other um, facilities in a region. And what we found is that we need to make some investments, which we are, okay. to make sure that we put production in the actual ESA, uh, including but not limited to uh, audio, yeah. um, lighting, et cetera. Because that's my concern, sure right? It's like, competitive. it's called the Entertainment and Sports Arena, but I often just see it sports events. Mm -hmm. So obviously I know you market every space. So there has to be some sort of, there was something that was holding that space back in terms of its ability to compete with an Eagle Bank in terms of mm -hmm. um, venue size, yes. right? Yeah, so we'll also what we're doing is so we have a, um, a production director in LA right now attending Polestar, which is an in international convention oh, yeah. uh, to make sure that we're booking um, in the ESA of various international promoters throughout the country to make sure that we're on those touring schedules okay. and that we are promoting um, ESA. Great, mm -hmm. I'm over time. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, one other thing, uh, so I know from Deputy Mayor Alpert that you, um, President Gates, are sitting on the, I forget what this particular- Gallery Place called. Chinatown mm -hmm. Task Force. Okay, there, yeah. <laughs> so, but there's, there's a task force on top of the task force for the task force to meet. Um, and I am curious how those conversations are going. I think it's it's you and, and the head of the library who's uh, yes. co-chairing your particular Correct. Node. Um, how, and, how and Jaron that? Price. Uh, it's going well. Uh, as a matter of fact, we just had uh, a meeting on Monday. We've been meeting every week since the announcement. Um, but we actually had a meeting on Monday that engaged several stakeholders. Uh, clean and safety is one uh, pillar of uh, the task force committee team that I'm on along with activations. And so uh, it's going well. Uh, one of the things that um, was the low hanging fruit just, you know, that instantly came to the forefront is there are a lot of activities that are happening, mm -hmm. but it hasn't been done in a consolidated manner for us to market and to promote. Um, when people are leaving the convention center, for example, you normally see, you know, if it's a break, a ton of people right. walking out the front door and heading directly towards the Gallery Place Chinatown area. We're going to do some additional due diligence on our part with highlighting what those restaurants are in that surrounding area, activities, and then we also do some uh, production signature events like unique experience events uh, that we're going to look to do some additional activations, and it can't just be in the evening. Right. We got to look at activations during lunchtime. Mm -hmm. uh, we also got to look at additional activations through, you know, maybe, you know, coffee type morning <laughs> activations to get people up and going. Yep. You know, it's nothing wrong, you okay. know, uh, with doing stuff in the, in the morning, but we can't just limit it to the to the evening opportunity. But the meeting was very, it was a two hour meeting on Monday, um, but very effective, very, very efficient. That's great. I heard you speaking a little bit with Councilmember McDuffie around, um, I forget what the question was, but you were saying that when people come for events, it's, it, for sporting events, sometimes it's multi-generational 
the whole family is coming mm-hmm. for whatever the tournament might be. Mm-hmm. And when I think about the downtown area, and you gonna have a different opinion on this, but <laughs> I don't exactly think of it as a family friendly destination, mm-hmm. right? So it's, we've come for the sporting event, but um, there's something for the older kids to do. There's very little for little people to do. Um, even if you think about the idea that, um, I think they were saying, you know, on I street, there's like a park every two mm-hmm. blocks or so mm-hmm. there's actually no playground mm. in like the entire downtown. You have to go. Mm. Shaw before you had a playground. Okay. Which is just something to think about from um well, look, now that it's been mentioned, uh, <laughs> I get I, one of the first things I'm going to have to do is no, really, I mean, like, it's, I, it's a small, it's a small, it's a small thing. Well, but it, not- if, if you think about from a multi-generational family standpoint, right, if you have a break in a conference or, oh, we're just going to run and do something really quickly. Yeah, I could take my kid out to the quote unquote park in front of um, the Carnegie Library, but that's actually not a park, right? right. Um, just small something. Well, that yeah. Well, council member, I, uh, it's interesting. Uh, and you know me very well. I think anytime there's an opportunity to resolve or evaluate or look at what's missing, uh, it's never small. I think that's something that we need to look at and look and see how we can, you know, correct it, uh, or look and see what we can implement or augment uh, two spaces that are here uh, in this downtown area. Uh, you've provided me with some food for thought, but I will say that um, that's something that I will personally make sure that we take a look at uh, at Events mm-hmm. DC and work with the you know, city collectively. But I think there are things uh, coming from an event and entertainment background. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can be intentional about things you bring in. So for example, uh, in talking about downtown, I worked with the downtown bid and we launched an event around the 4th of July holiday, uh, a, what we entitled was Kid, Kids World. And we took Franklin Park and everything that, you know, may be missing on a day-to-day basis was a huge influx of all things kids related. I mean, everything from the big teddy bear to a stage that was hosted by uh, kids and youth to the DJ that was spinning (laughs) kids and youth. But I think in a situation uh, that you're mentioning, if something's not there, I think we can look at an opportunity in a way to activate a space uh, to, to, to do that. I just also think about like, if I go to the airport now, like National Airport now has a play space in it. Mm -hmm. That seems small, but like it actually for the attraction of like, oh, okay, we can get to the airport early because I know you could burn off some energy before you Mm -hmm. get there. Mm It's something to think about anyway. Well, we have to take care of all of our residents. Mm -hmm. We have to take care of our young residents as well. (laughs) And tourists. The residents are great, but also for visitors coming to the area, if we think about anchoring in terms of spaces and attracting folks downtown Mm -hmm. it's great we have the the children's museum here down here down near the reagan building right but if you think about from the reagan building to the convention center Mm -hmm. what else is there and that's something that i'll definitely bring back to the team uh and just one of the things that instantly come to mind is uh creating um the that pop-up opportunity and aligning that pop-up opportunity with the calendar of events that's taking place so if we have a big sporting event taking place and you know as and i know you have uh, have attended you were actually at day of play uh with Mm -hmm. us as well um i do think there's definitely an opportunity for us to activate the space in such a way so that every member of the family will be able to have something that they can enjoy Thank you, Council Member Henderson. Let's see, um, Ms. Gates, you listed as a top priority for fiscal year 2024 a new sports business partnership for the RFK campus. Um, what do you hope to accomplish in fiscal year 2024, given that uh, the pending federal legislation on RFK? 
So for me, and, and what I think is important, particularly with that uh, opportunity, is between now and whatever happens at the end of the day with that particular campus, I have to look at ways to activate that space. Uh, things that I'm looking at are uh, opportunities where we could possibly do like modular uh, events with like a modular stadium stands to do anything from rugby to soccer, you know, games uh, across the board. So for me, uh, it was identifying some of the other uh, touch point sports that could utilize a space that we have on RFK campus to, to activate. Um, so rugby was one uh, thing that I was looking at, just looking at how things are matched out there. Also looking at some additional soccer opportunities as well. Um, friendlies uh, is the terminology that's used to host uh, uh, friendly, pretty much non-competitive uh, sporting events, but we have the space there to activate as well. Um, you mentioned that, you know, uh, the, the convention center really is a centerpiece for large conventions in the city. Um, you touched on the success of the DC Auto Show mm -hmm. that just occurred last month. Um, I understand that to keep up with other emerging cities, and we talked a little bit about competing conventions. Uh, one of your priorities is to um, look at upgrading parts of the convention center. Um, talk a bit about that, what you expect uh, to do there. Um, are you considering expansion? I know there was a, a recent article in mm -hmm. the Washington Business Journal. Mm -hmm. It sounded like it was based on questions that we sent to you and, and the responses that you Didn't provided it, to us. It definitely sounded like that, right? <laughs> Somebody's looking at our work. So, um, But talk a little bit about that. Uh, so one of the assessments we are doing, we're doing an assessment of the convention center. We're also looking to do assessments across the board uh, uh, with our 11 uh venues in our portfolio. But one of the things that we think that is important and crucial, uh, yes, we were named um, one of the top convention centers in, 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 in North America. We also uh, have uh, the best on-site support and the best customer service. But part of that requires us to stay at the forefront to remain competitive. So with this assessment, we're not only going to be assessing uh, ancillary spaces within the convention center, but also some ancillary spaces or available spaces surrounding the convention center uh, to make sure that we have the best opportunity. We're at, at probably 75% capacity uh, in general, and I never want to turn business away. Uh, and quite often people hear me say, you know, I consider any building or space that's available to host uh, organization uh, as an opportunity for us to, to, to do business. So with that being said, one example that I want to give, uh, and you, you're probably familiar with it, is like the downtown dining district. Prior to renovating and opening the downtown dining district a year ago, it was just an empty space. And, and we, I, I wanna say the first time we opened it was doing one of those basketball uh, tournaments and it was flooded um, with opportunities. And I wanna thank Aramark who partnered with us uh, to offer that food and beverage offerings. Um, we also did the uptown dining district a while back. And that also gave us an opportunity to highlight some of our local businesses like Ben's Chili Bowl. Uh, I wanna see if uh, Dr. Johnson wanna elaborate a little bit further. Uh, thank you, President Gates. As President Gates um, stated, we look for opportunities um, to expand um, in the convention center, but also our other properties. Um, in regards to our expansion, we look at opportunities that we could provide um, those um, traditional uh, population that has been possibly marginalized, such as those women um, and persons of color, um, to give them an opportunity uh, to be a part of um, what we're doing in terms of expansion within the Walt T. Washington Convention Center and other respective properties. Um, as um, President Gates stated, um, Ben Shilly Bowl, um, they've been given an opportunity um, in the convention center, but also we have um, the Made in DC, of which we sell products um, right um, in the Walt T. Washington Convention Center where our local of small uh, businesses. Great. Um, what is, what's the typical sort of life in terms of the number of years um, for a convention center? How long should the, the convention centers generally last before you have to 
you know, just start all over, build a new one or do some significant renovation? That's a, that's a, that's an excellent question, which is part of why we're conducting an assessment okay. now. Uh, what I will tell you when you talk about uh, over a million visitors and thousands of people coming throughout our convention center facility, uh, the wear and tear that occurs, like it's, it's constantly in phases. Like right now, we're uh, doing work on the roof. Right. You know, um, we're, it's been 20 years. Right. Uh, yeah, we celebrated 20 years. We celebrated 20 years. And for us to celebrate 20 years and get our LEED Gold certification, like that's phenomenal, almost unrealistic. But I mean, it's the Walter E. Washington mm -hmm. Convention Center. So right. we do what's unrealistic. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, it, it, it things like uh, even the carpet in uh, like the wear and tear there is it requires constant updating um and so we there's no like long-term life period sp for specific things because the number of events we do with the number of people walking through those halls and corridors you could have expected it to last you know to next year until you know there's a tear in the rug and you have to get it, Got it. you know fixed just a couple more questions uh, from me uh, i was happy to see the two delayed uh albeit clean audits for events DC for fiscal year 2022 and 2023 that were released last week after significant delay due to the 2022 cyber attack. Uh, I know you and I talked pretty extensively. It came before the committee last year, um, not too long after you actually uh, uh, assumed that role. Uh, I talked to the CFO extensively about it, the auditor, but the ACFR and the audit report outlined a series of recommendations. What progress have you made on those recommendations? Significant progress. <laughs> um, so that was one of the uh, first challenges uh, that actually became an opportunity to really uh, tighten up uh, our IT infrastructure. Uh, several things uh, took place, everything from hiring a chief information technology officer for one. In addition to that, um, we, we couldn't just stop with one person. We ended up hiring a chief information security officer and then built a robust larger uh, IT team. Um, we didn't just uh, utilize our own resources. We worked with the Department of Homeland Security. They have a team called the CISA team that really specializes in uh, making sure that we're doing the best practices possible when it comes to uh, our IT infrastructure. Uh, we have a, a, a two-step multi-factor authenticator that's required for our staff. It's now mandatory training that's constantly in, in place for any, any of our employees. Uh, we not only require the training, but we test our employees. Like we'll send a, a email to see if someone happens to click on it. Uh, and on the rare occasion that has happened, then it's additional training that has, has been required as well. We have what we call eyes on glass. So we have our system monitored 24 seven around the clock. To touch a little bit on the audit aspect of it, and one of the key things that had to happen immediately is the redundancy in our files. So we not only have like the iCloud type of redundancy, we have redundancy on site. But in addition to that, uh, everyone's familiar with like Iron Mountain. We have, uh, it's it, we got stuff in the mountain. Right. <laughs> um, but all of that has been uh, crucial. And technology is uh, always uh, ever changing. Uh, but I make it a point to uh, make sure that we stay ahead of it. I also want to utilize this as an opportunity to uh, turn to my CFO. Uh, and I want to thank uh, CFO Glenn Lee and our CFO here, Henry Mosley, for the hard work that that team had to do. We had to hire a forensic accounting firm. I didn't know what a forensic accounting firm was. I do now. Um, but CLA was the forensic accounting firm that we, we hired uh, who did the due diligence of rebuilding our financial statements. So I tell you what, if anyone wants to know what's necessary to build a solid <laughs> IT infrastructure, I can, I can tell you. Uh, I wanna see if the CFO has an opportunity to wanna add anything. Uh, just uh, make sure you say your name for the record and, and if you can keep it brief. Because sure. Very brief, sir. Henry Mosley, uh, Chief Financial Officer for PVCC. Um, as the CEO stated, much investment was made so that we could restore uh, our technology requirements. You will see when you look at the audit that in 22, they stated certain things, but in 23, those issues were all resolved. 
So as she indicated, we moved forward swiftly. So there's not an impacting us. This yeah, no, I certainly saw that. I was the first question I posed to the <laughs> auditor and the CFO, uh, and I was briefing about the act for. Um, thank you for that. Uh, just really quickly, so I can turn to Councilmember Henderson for a final round. Um, does Events DC have a sexual harassment officer, and has the position been vacant at any point during FY23 or 2024 to date? Uh, yes, we do have a sexual harassment officer, or the name. Uh, or two internally is the show. Uh, and then we also work closely with our general counsel team. Uh, and we follow the district's policy uh, okay. as well with sexual harassment. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, finally, CB Spingos, just briefly, uh, if you could talk me through your answer to question 36 regarding the SDC CBE SB Spingos, both your fiscal year 2023 and 2024 numbers uh, left me with some questions. I know there was some asterisk there, uh, but the if you can explain them for the record. Yeah. <laughs> the infamous yeah. asterisk. So we did uh, fulfill uh, our CBE goal and actually succeeded uh, our CBE goal uh, in 22 and 23. Um, we succeeded by like one 102 percent for uh, 22 and in 23 where you see the asterisk uh, it shows we uh, reached the goal and uh, propelled it by 618 percent so I'm sure that's where the question comes into play uh, I'll turn it over to my executive vice president just to uh, explain that asterisk okay. aspect of it uh, thank you president Gates in regards to uh, FY 23 um, the SBE goal I'm um, stated in the green book is 1.3 million and the spend is uh, 8.6 million in terms of the spend. Uh, I want to mention that uh, we're working very closely with DSLBD. Um, DSLBD will be open in their portal um, this February, in which case when DSLBD open their portal, um, it'll be a further review and evaluation of the total um, ex um, exclusions and total um, um, expenditures related to FY23. Um, some of those include um, exclusions will consist of subsidies and transfers, as well as um, definition um, um, uh, in, um, and inclusions. Um, so as we look at that information, we anticipate that that SBE goal would increase to about $6 million in which we would still exceeded the spend since we spent $8.6 million. Got it, got it. And just for folks who are wondering, you know, FY 23, 23 is over, but this is a process that you engage with DSLBD in terms of reconciliation? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So reconciliation DSLBD, not only are we looking at the SBE, but also the emphasis on CBE as well, mm -hmm. I mean, which mm -hmm. we um, have exceeded the goal in paying attention to our CBE and SBE. And we'll goals. probably do just by way of follow-up, because I think uh, your, your goal, well, you already said your goal is, is likely to increase, but you still will likely have exceeded that goal for FY23. Just for the record, the, the, the spend goal for FY 2024 is higher than either of the spends for 2022 and 2023. In fact, it's higher than both combined. There's a reason for that if you want to share publicly sure. what thank, it is. Because the number you. is 27 million. Yes, thank you so much for, as you stated, um, the FY 24 uh, projected goal currently is 14 million. Okay. And um, however, the, um, the goal for FY 23, even with the um, Ch or the adjustment from 1.3 million to estimated 6 million, it will still be substantially higher. Uh, once um, again, DSLBD continuous evaluation, they will look at, um, you know, actual procurements such as proprietary technology, such as what we submitted for review, such as Fuji Tech, who does our elevators and, um, and escalators, as well as other proprietary technology. And we anticipate that the goal for FY24 would decrease that would be more in line with the mean that has been um, previously on the average of about seven to eight million dollars. Okay. And just to be clear, I, I use the number 27 million. You said 14 million for 2024. The just I'm gonna run down this really quickly because yeah, I think we're both right, but they're for sure. different reasons. The Green Book expendable budget, according to the information you provided, um, is fifty four point three million dollars. The SBE spend goal is $27.1 million. And the anticipated adjustable SBE goal is $14.6 million, which is the number that you referenced in your uh, your response there. So I wanted to just make sure those numbers were out there and, and we anticipate some additional fluctuation in those numbers along the fiscal year. So I don't have additional questions. I'm going to turn to Councilmember Henderson for a final round. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman McDuffie. 
Um, I, I wanted to ask President Gates about the relationship of Events DC to some of the public schools in the area, particularly for the use of um, the fields at mm -hmm. RFK. Mm -hmm. So we, we have a relationship with uh, not only the public schools, but the charter schools. Um, one of the things that we talked about earlier was like the use of the fields. Uh, so uh, School Without Walls was one example that I gave that we work with. Uh, CRISP is the uh, organization that we work with that are helping facilitate the rental of the fields. 70% uh, of those rentals are all tied to the sports aspect of it. Uh, in addition to that, if we find that uh, there's an entity that may have any type of financial challenges uh, with having access to the fields, we also have a waiver program that's available where they can apply for some assistance to be able to have access to the fields. Great. I appreciate you all working with School Without Walls on, on that particular issue because yes. I, I think the fields at RFK, um, I won't call them a hidden gym, but it also still feels like not a lot of people know that they mm -hmm. exist as an mm -hmm. option mm -hmm. um, for recreation on that side. Um, and some of that could be just because Technically, they are hidden with the, <laughs> you got to go under a thing to kind of get to them and, and, and those kinds of things, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I have been receiving, though, a lot of emails lately, and I think Councilmember McDuffie kind of alluded to this in terms of the planning around what happens next with RFK. First, mm -hmm. well, the existing stadium structure, mm -hmm. um, what, what is the schedule now in terms of the demolition of that? Uh, thank Structure. you. Thank you for that question. And uh, I also just want to add, uh, I think I surprised all the neighbors in Kingman Park uh, on October 31st. You know, people were uh, doing trick or treat and I was popping up as the president and CEO of Events DC knocking on doors, just saying hello to everyone. But that was a question uh, that came that came up as relates to the demolition. Uh, we're working with National Park Service. Uh, we require the approval of National Park Service before we can proceed with the demolition is two areas that we're still waiting to get approval on. One is uh, uh, section 106, which ties primarily to the historic uh, aspect uh, and making sure that we meet the requirements uh, on the historical side. And then there's uh, NEPA, which is tied to the uh, environmental aspect that we're waiting to get approval on. We're really close. Um, this has been a, a work in progress for a very long time, but we're hoping to get uh, an approval from National Park Service to proceed with the demolition. We are working with the CBE uh, smooth construction, but once we receive the approval, it's probably going to still be an 18 month process, 12 to 18 month process uh, to get the stadium um, demolished. Um, we're not doing an imploding like a scene from a movie, um, but it, it's, it's, it's not happening this year. <laughs> 12 to 18 months. Okay. Yes. That is a, a long time to stare at a it is. rusty shelter. <laughs> Nonetheless. Um, okay. The, there had been conversations of plans about um, the building of a new sports complex mm -hmm. for indoor track and other types of things. What is the status of that project? So there there has been discussions uh, regarding uh, the sports facility. Uh, that is being handled uh, through Director uh, Thene Freeman's okay. office with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, but we're, you know, there to collaborate and, and work with the DPR team uh, regarding the execution of that space. And one of the things that we're doing at Events DC, which we talked about uh, earlier as well, is just looking how to to, um, maintain activation and getting the you know space act activated. So outside of the stadium um, itself, you know we also have the RFK uh, festival grounds. Yep along with the fields, you know, DC Armory and the skate park. So um, while DPR uh, is doing their assessment and evaluation and preparing for the next step, we're, you know, we stand ready to work with them on that project. Okay. I do think it's great in terms of how you all have kept the space sort of active, even down to, you know, my, I chair the health committee. We deal a lot with the farmer's markets mm -hmm. and uh, the farmer's market there at the RFK site is like one of the more profitable um farmers markets in the city, given, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't, is accessibility for folks on the East end to be able to 
buy locally sourced fresh produce um, and then comp using a lots of other programs. But um, the the folks who run that one, they do very well. Yeah, it's funny you said that. I actually just bought a bag of pecans <laughs> from a vendor. That I'm, it reminded me of like being back home down south. Um, but one of the things, uh, I don't know if you are aware with that farmer's market, like it's been going on for years, like almost 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're looking about, um, looking to do is really tell that story um, from a documentary perspective about that farmer's market and just the history and what it, you know, means to that community and the people of Washington, D.C. Thank you, Chairman McDuffie. Thank you, President. And thank you, Councilman Henderson. Thank you, President Gates and your team for your testimony this morning. We're going to move to our next entity, uh, which is Destination D.C. Uh, Destination D.C. is a private nonprofit corporation that serves as the lead organization to market Washington, D.C., both domestically and internationally as a premier global destination for conventions, tourism, and special events. A contracting arm of Events DC, the organization is funded by a percentage of the DC's hotel occupancy tax, along with membership dues and cooperative marketing fees. By developing and executing centralized and cohesive sales and marketing strategies, Destination DC generates economic development for the district through tourism. Uh, I'm gonna call up President and CEO Elliot Ferguson and, and others associated with Destination DC, I uh, believe board chair Ron Bracco is uh, gonna join as well. Um, before you all are seated, I'd love to swear you in. Um, if you could, raise your right hands. Uh, do you each swear or affirm on the penalty law that the testimony you're about to provide to the Committee on Business and Economic Development and the Council of the District of Columbia is the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? We do. We do. Thank you. We do have one more member that's coming. She just ran to the bathroom. So. Okay. All right. If she's planning to testify, I'll, I'll swear her in before she does. Okay. Um, Good morning to each of you. Thanks for being here. I'll turn to you, uh, President Ferguson, for your testimony whenever you're ready. Good morning to you as well. Good morning to the committee. Um, before we start, uh, we do have testimony from our the chairman of our board, Ron Bracco. So we'll turn it over to him. Good morning, Councilman McDuffie uh, and members of the Committee of, uh, on Business and Economic Development. I'm Ron Bracco, Destination DC Board Chair and Vice President of Events at Harbor a full service company that has been honored to produce every uh, major historic event in the nation's capital for the last 70 years. We work very closely with Destination DC and benefit from the visitation, from more visitation, which is the purpose for Destination DC's work. I congratulate Elliot and his team for their efforts. Adequate funding has been at the center of Destination DC's ability to market the city. Uh, on behalf of the board, we appreciate everything that you and the, destiny, uh, and the DC council members did to pass the tourism recovery district legislation. Now with Destination DC, uh, now Destination DC is better positioned to compete with other top tier destinations around the world for more visitors. Destination DC is a great in, uh, partner for large scale events coming to the, uh, to the city, which creates impact for us all. For instance, the World Culture Fest uh, was an amazing global event on the National Mall this last fall. Its scale and its importance could only happen in DC. The city, Events DC, and other partners were all champions and businesses benefited. Hotels, unions, support companies, event rentals, labor, the list goes on. And events like this have a real impact. Destination DC also makes it easy to see why visitors should attend and understand why the city is an attractive uh, uh, option to stay beyond the event. Other occasions coming up like the NATO summit in July, uh, coinciding with the 75th anniversary and World Pride in 2025, benefit from Destination DC's ability to join the hospitality industry in support and entice visitors to stay longer, resulting in greater uh, uh, economic impact. I know that racial equity and inclusivity is important uh, and a priority for you and the DC Council. It is a, a priority for Destination DC and is a priority for Hargrove. The city's diversity is reflective in the Destination DC's marketing. People can see themselves in the only one DC campaign and in our neighborhoods, leaders, cuisine, and more. There's a clear message that everyone is welcome in DC. 
Yes, the nation DC is uh, also embraces sustainability. It is the first urban destination with a role dedicated, dedicated to sustainability. And this gives me great pride. Destination DC leverages the city's efforts uh, and pays attention to what meeting planners are looking for. In, in my own business, the in event production, there's so much more that can be done. Uh, carbon footprint can be huge. And so every step we take uh, uh, to lessen that impact is crucial to our future. So uh, in closing, Destination DC's priority is increasing tourism to improve the quality of life for residents in all eight wards of our city. It remains crucial, crucial to the sport of their efforts in bringing all types of travelers from around the world to Washington, DC. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify. And thank you for your testimony this morning. Let's turn it next to Ms. Ferguson. Absolutely. Again, good morning to uh, you, Councilmember McDuffie, and to other members of the committee. As was referenced, I'm Elliot Ferguson, President and CEO of Destination DC, with the Economic Development Organization for Washington, focusing on more visitors coming to Washington. You know, as a private nonprofit organization, 94% of our funding comes from the hotel tax generated by visitors that are physically coming into the city and staying to the, in hotels. Uh, and we are able to utilize those dollars in our marketing efforts. The economic impact of those dollars spent by visitors is over $8.1 billion in the city, which generates $1.6 billion in tax revenues and over 84,000 jobs. Our mission solely is to increase visitation to Washington, D.C., and in those efforts, it impacts the quality of life for those residents, such as myself, that live in Washington. And that's really why marketing Washington matters as a destination. Uh, we talked uh, several times about the Tourism Recovery District. I want to thank you, the mayor, other members of city council, the um, deputy mayor uh, of economic development for focusing on getting those additional dollars to us through the legislation in December of last year. We started receiving those funds in June of 2023. Uh, the 1% increase in hotel taxes not only assisted us uh, in terms of doubling our, or increasing our budget, but also providing additional uh, dollars to market Washington as a whole. Uh, it provided an additional $8.9 million in fiscal year 2023, while helping our budget grow in 2024 to $46 million, which is up 21%. The key for, goal for us is how do we continue to focus on DC's uh, image outside of Washington, DC, and these dollars give us a chance to do that with domestic advertising as well as international advertising. We've talked several times about the importance of all markets, but the international market is extremely important to us. Uh, before the Tourism Recovery District dollars, we had four offices and uh, representatives in China, uh, in the uh, UK, Australia, India, uh, and in New Zealand. But with the additional dollars, we now have representation in Brazil, Mexico, and Canada, and then a person in the UK or an office in the UK that focuses on international meetings. The goal is to attract more valuable meetings, conventions, sporting events, uh, and all types of events that bring visitors to Washington as a destination. As an organization and as a destination, we compete globally with other cities. And while our position has improved as a destination, we still continue to fight uh, for visitors coming to our destination uh, and with cities that have larger budgets. Um, for an example, Visit Orlando spends over $100 million in promoting their destination and Visit Florida spends an additional $80 million, that plus the revenue associated with the assets in those destinations. For us, it's all about how we're able to bring more visitors to the city. And in that regard, there's a return on investment study that's done every single year that focuses on what is the efficacy of our efforts. We do this in tandem with the Chief Financial Officer's Office and last year, we're pleased to see that for every dollar spent in promoting Washington, D.C., there was a $3.49 return on investment uh, in terms of taxes being generated by visitors coming to Washington. Last November, we launched a new campaign. There's only one D.C., which highlights experiences like uh, no other destination can claim. For example, the 100 free things to see and do in, in our city, the great restaurants that we have that have been validated by the Michelin Guide, of course, dining, parks, shopping, nightlife, music, sports, and many other activities. As a reminder to those listening, our marketing is always outward facing. So you'll never see an ad for Washington in Washington, 
But if you go to our website, washington.org, you'll have a chance to see exactly how we promote our destination. Outside of the region, we face um, a lot of issues as a destination, including perception. Um, it's always tied to, is DC as exciting as other destinations? And that's what we focus on as well. The current budget gives us the wherewithal to do that more with our campaign, uh, which was developed with all audiences in mind, uh, representing the community as a whole. The international community, which is a major focus for us, uh, is important because as an economic development organization, we're focusing on those that will stay longer and spend more, and that's tied to the international, F, uh, international market. It's also impactful for the meetings market, both domestically and internationally, as we're looking at uh, bringing those visitors into the city, and the fact that we have such great speakers, companies, and an influential leaders in our destination. The campaign clearly has resonated with, this, with the business community. I appreciate the fact that the mayor uh, and the deputy mayor has continued, have continued to reference the campaign and efforts to bring other city organizations under um, the There's Only One DC umbrella. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is extremely important to us. Um, you heard last week from some of our DEI business fellows uh, as we developed that program in 2022 to make sure that small minority owned businesses have a chance to uh, play a role in the visitors and businesses coming to the city. The American Experience Foundation also is extremely important to us as we're able to engage with the seven hospitality schools that focus on uh, leadership within the hospitality industry. Uh, and we're bringing uh, not only scholars, offering scholarships to students, but also offering internships and other career opportunities uh, through this particular program. So we work closely with the deputy mayor, as was referenced before, and other entities in terms of what we're doing to promote DC. I'm pleased to be um, welcomed or joined by our, uh, our, C our chief financial officer, John Kim, to my right, and our chief marketing officer, Robin McLean, to my left. Uh, this concludes my testimony, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have. Thank you um, for your testimony this morning. I do have some questions about uh, Destination DC. Uh, before I jump into uh, my questions on around, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined uh, virtually by Ward 1 Council Member Brianne Nadeau. Thank you for joining, Council Member. Uh, we're going to turn to you next for a round. All right, let me begin by talking about some of y'all's efforts uh, that you mentioned in your testimony around DEI. Uh, in your pre-hearing responses, you mentioned uh, the top types of travelers that the district receives, such as suburban dwellers, LGBTQ plus travelers, and Latin travelers. Is there a concerted effort by Destination DC to reach these individual groups that you mentioned. Uh, so I'd love to hear more about your efforts, talk about, um, if any, which areas do you see growth potential for these types of travelers in the district? Uh, with World Pride coming up, are you working with in coordination with uh, the planning committee uh, and the district government to prepare and market the city for that event? Um, and also, um, I know this is a multi-part question, but what targeted outreach are you making uh, in the international markets? I know you probably have a lot to talk about with that one, so we'll, we'll put that one on the back end. But if you could talk about uh, the first part of that question regarding uh, specific types of travelers uh, and just any efforts that you might have to engage them. Absolutely. I'll start the, um, the conversation and then I'll rely on my chief marketing officer, Robin, to also give additional context. Um, as a destination that's welcoming to the global community, clearly diversity is extremely important to us, not only from a domestic perspective, but also a global perspective. Um, we spend a lot of time focusing on the dynamics of how diverse DC as it is as a destination. And we utilize that in our marketing efforts simply because that's one of the, the positives as to why people wanna to come to Washington. 
they love monuments, memorials, and museums, but it's the people, it's the community that really makes a difference. Um, our efforts are tied to all types of communities that um, have the wherewithal to travel, specifically as we talk about the LGBTQIA market, uh, we play an active role not only in attracting that, that, um, that particular audience, but also in organizations like the International Gay Travel uh, Association. Teresa Bolposi, our Senior VP of Tourism is on the board. We are actively involved in um, their efforts to promote the US to the global market. Um, last year, um, we were in India uh, with IGLTA, um, as that's one of our key markets, promoting um, Washington as a destination and welcoming um, that audience, the IGLTA um, audience, to Washington as a whole. So diversity as a whole um, is a huge part of what we're focusing on as we're looking at bringing visitors to the city. We look at it from the diversity associated with the U.S. traveler as well as the global traveler, which is extremely important to us. I'll, I'll start and talk about um, the target markets in terms of international, um, what we're doing from an international perspective, and then I'll let Robin take it from here. Um, as I referenced, um, we've already had offices or representation in China, in India, in the UK, uh, in New Zealand, Australia, um, and now we are reinstituting an, a representation in the country of Brazil, uh, a new office in Mexico, and a new office in Canada, and of course for the international market um, with London for meetings. Um, those markets are specific to us. We work really closely with the airports authority um, in terms of burgeoning uh, populations, changing economies in those particular uh, destinations, and equally as much nonstop flights to Washington, which makes a huge difference. So though our marketing is tied to all aspects, all, all parts of the globe, we're clearly focusing on those areas where we see the best opportunity for visitation. China clearly is still lagging right now because of COVID, but we're still we're seeing momentum and we're hoping that in the next couple of years or in the next few months or so, we'll see more nonstop flights specifically to Dulles um, from China. So all those markets are really important to us. And with the There's Only One DC campaign and the TRD dollars, Robin and team, uh, along with Teresa uh, in tourism, are focusing on how we're spending them. And I'll turn it over to Robin. But before you begin, if I could, I know you, you stepped out, so I want to swear you in before you provide oh, your right. testimony, if you don't mind uh, raising your right hand. Uh, do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to provide to the Council of the District of Columbia and the Committee on Business and Economic Development is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Um, thank you. Uh, I'll, thank I'll let you. the record know that you responded in affirmative. I know your microphone wasn't on at that point, but good morning to you. Uh, I thank do. you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. um, I will just add to what um, Elliot shared. I think with World Pride in particular, the name implies we're going to be promoting this worldwide, and so we are. And so we'll be in different markets, um, both internationally and domestically, to be at World Pride, e uh, to be at Pride events throughout this year. Um, to be promoting for next year. Um, in addition to that, we'll be doing some specific advertising, targeting people who are attending these events, um, certainly on the domestic side, um, that's complemented by representation from our international offices in some of the um, markets like the UK, Canada, Berlin, um, just to name a few. So um, you also asked about uh, DEI and some of the marketing um, there. I'll, I'll give you an example of something that we're able to do differently this year with our TRD dollars. So we have a marketing specialist uh, role that we brought in-house to focus on working with content creators and social influencers. So you mentioned your children. I'm certain, you know, they're seeing videos and, and social media. Um, that influence is something that's really important for us to both bet with influencers, but so that we know we're working with the right people to tell our story, but also it allows us really firm control over how we're working with them. And so an example for this month, um, we have a Date Nights DC campaign every um, February. We have a Black influencer. Um, her um, handle is The Brunch Bell. And so we're working with her to tell that story, but it it's kind of a double tiered approach, if you will. So Black influencer, but talking about date nights within the city. And so that's just an example of something that we're doing differently um, throughout the entire year. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I really appreciate you sharing that. I, I do wanna you know, uh, 
to, to, to folks who might be at home listening, um, I know you've come before the committee countless times and, and you talked about the importance of the international market. Um, you talked about um, the dollars associated with the international tourist versus the domestic tourists. And, and I think it bears underscoring, if you could just talk a little bit more about like what actually happens in those international offices, right? Sure. Um, I mean, you, you physically travel there. I don't know probably members of your team. I think one time I, I reached out to just talk about how everything was going. I think you were there or maybe just getting back from a recent trip. Um, what goes on in those international offices and how exactly is it supporting the work that Destination is, uh, DC is doing um, here to bring tourism to the District of Columbia to help fill our convention center uh, with conventions and conferences and events across the District of Columbia? Yeah, absolutely. Very good question and um, a good opportunity to dispel the perception of how glamorous these trips are. Um, we actually have representatives that work for organizations that solely focus on marketing destinations. So let's say an organization has 50 employees that does destination marketing or destination marketing for different destinations around the US. We will pay them to have two reps that solely focus on promoting Washington. Uh, that is tied to um, the way travelers from those particular countries actually travel, unlike the United States. Most of them use travel agents. They rely on travel agents to do everything from soup to nuts, something that was disbanded mostly in the 80s with deregulation of travel agents and the uh, commissions years and years ago. Um, but they're still using travel agents. If we're talking China, more than 80% of them are calling on a company, a good example, C-Trip, that has over 30,000 employees that are solely focusing on those Chinese that are traveling to different destinations and influencing them as to where they should go. Um, when they're influencing them on coming to the United States, um, you know, you've heard us talk before about we're the eighth most visited destination. Um, you know, they're talking about us, but they're also talking about other destinations. And so our goal is to make sure that they know how diverse DC is as a city above and beyond monuments, memorials, and museums. Um, and so to a certain extent, a huge part of what we're doing is going over, doing events with them, working with the airlines to physically bring them to Washington, because there's one thing for the guy who sells DC to say DC is great. There's another thing for them to physically come here and say, wow, DC has more to offer. Um, they're also setting up um, different types of interviews with, with television stations. Uh, a good example, we were in Australia in August of last year. We were with the city of Boston, the city of Philadelphia, we were on the Today Show um, and talking about each of our destinations because most from that region of the country travel for 21 days. Um, we, we did specific things there. The, the, um, the media came here um, and then did those things and then created a story on how to navigate uh, a trip uh, from Australia, New Zealand and enjoying each of those, those areas. Uh, we're heading to India at the end of the month. Uh, we'll be there for five days. We'll hit two cities. So to put that in perspective, five days, two cities, more than four or five events in each city. So it's a very impactful time, whereas we're meeting with these folks, we're doing training on how to promote DC as a destination, we're, we're doing um, interviews with media, uh, and then of course, getting them um, engaged in a way where they'll wanna come to Washington and see our city for themselves. The goal with the travel agencies is to make sure that they understand the things that are in DC that perhaps are new, such as the development of the wharf, things that are new since we've talked um, in February of last year, since we were in the city. And so we do that in various destinations um, with other cities in some cases, but in a case like this year, when we go to India, we'll be by ourselves. Um, you mentioned uh, the monuments, malls and museums earlier in one of your responses. And I'm, I'm curious um, if there are things um, and I kind of have a sense of this answer, but I think it's important to give you an opportunity to talk about it. Places outside of those sort of federal enclave that Destination DC promotes in terms of tourism uh, and hospitality, um, are there campaigns associated with directing some of those tourist dollars, uh, not necessarily to compete for other things that are downtown. We want them to do that and 
Um, are there efforts to promote areas of the District of Columbia outside of the federal enclave? And, and have you highlighted any, you know, black history or, or, or cultural uh, comp uh, aspects of DC in your marketing campaigns, particularly given that February is Black History Month? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the there's only one DC campaign tied to other campaigns, whereas the team hears me say over and over again, um, you know, let's limit the number of monuments, memorials, and museums in our advertising because we have a destination above and beyond um, the traditional aspect of coming to Washington in which we want to promote. So that's, we've been doing that for a long time uh, in terms of um, all eight wards, uh, focusing on things in which people can see and do in, in those wards. I think the thing that has helped us a lot is the continuous development in Washington in different areas like Union Market you know, we had um, we had all of our reps in the in the city uh, for our global marketplace two weeks ago, and they stayed in different hotels, mostly not in in the downtown area, just for that reason to get folks to understand that though they see D.C. as a federal experience, we we have more to offer, and uh, in that regard, that's exactly what we focus on in our marketing campaign. If you you know, as, as the viewers go to Washington.org, they'll see one of several, um, if they look at the advertising that we do in different cities, the, um, the, the commercials that they may, that if you go to Jacksonville, you'll see in a, on TV, there are several different spots that really focus on um, the diversity of Washington above and beyond the, uh, the, the experience that most people normally recognize. And how do you all sort of measure internally uh, the success of your different marketing campaigns? I know uh, you talked about um, the there's only one DC campaign. Yes. And when you set about these types of campaigns, do you do you put a timeline on it at the outset, or are you measuring the success along the way? Um, um, how do you think about and approach these marketing campaigns? Um, and do you are there lessons learned along the way that you tweak? certain aspects of the campaign? Do you have a backup campaign in case it's not hitting the mark in terms of what you hope to achieve? Talk a little bit about uh, how that works. I'll uh, start it and then I'll turn it over to Robin since this is clearly in her, her space. But um, we're always focusing on um, what will resonate um, in a way um, locally to a certain extent. I love when locals say they love the campaign, but it's really about what our office is globally uh, are telling us um, the perception of Washington, D.C. is because clearly the marketing is always outward facing. So as much as I appreciate when we did D.C. Cool and everyone adopted it, and I said, great, um, but what's important to us is that does it resonate with those people that are on the West Coast that are thinking about traveling to the East Coast and now saying, what's cool about D.C.? Let's go to the website. So that's always a question um, that's how we start. Uh, and then we start thinking along the lines of what will resonate um, from a global perspective and a domestic perspective. You know, we going back to the international versus domestic visitor, the average Chinese visitor spends over $10,000. The average domestic visitor spends less than $1,000. So I want everyone, but as an economic development organization, clearly we want those that will stay longer and spend more. So that's the international market. They're only 7% of visitation right now, so we want to grow that, that market even more. And so the campaign gives us a chance to, to have people think differently about Washington. And then there is a study that's done in terms of the efficacy uh, that's done by an external organization that um, then we share. We do that in tandem with the chief financial officer's office. It's not us sitting in a room saying, we know it's great and uh, here's the return on investment, but they're really studying all the dynamics in terms of the impact of the campaign, doing interviews with those that have seen the campaign, did it influence their decision? How did it influence their decision? Um, and equally as much as we're looking at promoting or putting together a campaign, uh, Robin and her team are focusing on um, uh, focus groups, what works, what doesn't work, what should we change, what should we tweak? Um, the thing about Washington as a destination is that we always have to have a backup plan what if, what if the government shuts down? Um, things that other cities don't have. So we're always positioning ourselves, whereas not only the current campaign, but other 
iterations of our marketing that are associated with if the government shuts down, there's not a padlock on New York Avenue or 395. You can still come into Washington and see and enjoy different things in our destination. So um, I'm sure Robin's going to hopefully say I covered it well, but she can offer additional perspective. Of course you did. Um, I'll just add to what you were illuminating in terms of the annual ROI study that um, that's something that we do each fall. And so it's looking at the previous year's campaign. So um, last year, that was for every dollar spent on our advertising, $3.49 came back to the city in taxes. So we get to see that lift and that came up from um, $3.08 in terms of impact. So, you know, 40 cents more um, makes a big difference. The other thing I would just say is, is that for There's Only One DC, we uh, talked with consumers through our um, research company uh, to get in front of them about uh, their feelings about that campaign. We put creative in front of them to see how they responded to it. And I think the strength of this campaign, even though uh, for the study I just shared, we won't know the full impact until this fall of the new campaign, we can tell you with certainty that consumers like it because um, it really focuses on what's special about DC. So at the highest point of inspiration, um, as we call like the consumer funnel, is that inspirational piece with video. And the video highlights experiences that you can only have in DC. So we know we're a world-class city. We compete on every level with other destinations, but only in DC can you have these sets of experiences. So maybe it's, um, yes, the Library of Congress, um, which is free to go to. It's the largest library in the world, but it's also about our great restaurants in, in any place, but like, we're, um, we have um, the Michelin Guide and James Beard award-winning restaurants, but you can only see that National Mall view um, through some of, uh, through here, but through some of those experiences at restaurants and bars and, and hotels. So um, we highlight all of those specific experiences. Got it. Specific to your question about Black History Month, um, every single um, opportunity that we have to highlight um, not only Black History Month, but this is, you know, Chinese New Year this month, where our team is looking at all those 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 opportunities mm -hmm. to highlight things that um, are tied to Washington, D.C., things in which visitors should enjoy, that perhaps because it's Black History Month, because it's um, Chinese New Year, um, we want them to also, we want to heighten those experiences. These are things we do year round, mm -hmm. but, you know, every single beginning of every month, we in the office talk about everything that's celebrated within that month. I think there's there's also something tied to women's history this month as well that will be celebrated and promoted on our website through our social media channels and the likes. And may I just add that those are the uh, some of the best performing, um, best performing content on our website. Mm -hmm. um, and through our paid search efforts, uh, people are finding that information. So Washington.org is coming up high in the search and people are finding that information for through our things to do this weekend, things to do this month. Um, so it's inspirational, but very effective. Okay. Um, and speaking of, of effective, uh, just to, to um, maybe the last question along this line of questions, uh, in your responses, you mentioned uh, a tax ROI um, Talk about taxes generated compared to Destination DC's media spend of three dollars and forty nine cents for every dollar spent on media. Um, might be worth just talking a little bit about how how that's calculated and sort of what kinds of revenues are included in your analysis there. If you don't mind, I'll ask Robin to ask, sure, also answer sure. that. So it's looking at people who are who have been influenced to come to DC because of our advertising. So you start by asking a set of questions um, and you get down to only people who've come to DC and say that they came um, as a result of our advertising. So that's important to note first. So it's, they didn't come for a wedding um, and they're answering this. They, they didn't come for business travel. They came, they saw our ad, they were inspired and they're crediting that um, with, with their experience. And so when they're here, what do they spend money on? There's the, 
share about what hotel spend they had, what restaurant spend they have, what kind of entertainment spend they have. And so all of that is uh, collected and estimated. And that's how um, we get that final for every dollar spent, $3.49 comes back to the city in taxes. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, let's talk about uh, CBEs and your spend. Um, certified business enterprises, small business enterprise and district when we obviously priority. I think you mentioned it in your uh, testimony. I think the chair actually mentioned it, um, some of the work around equity that, that Destination DC does. Uh, I know there's a DEI fellowship that you all have initiated with your partner organizations. I wanna give you an opportunity to talk about your numbers in terms of um, procurement dollars to spend with CBEs and SBEs in the District of Columbia. Um, were there any efforts to expand and increase that work? Um, and, and then also talk about the DEI fellowship that you all have and just the types of outreach um, with how you attract those types of, um, how you really are marketing those opportunities to local folks. Sure, I'll start with the DEI fellowship and then um, I'll start talking about CBE and then turn it over to our chief financial officer, John Kim to offer a different additional perspective. So the DEI fellowship, um, as we were looking at ways in which we can um, have small businesses um, in Washington, D.C. become more involved in our efforts was one of those opportunities where as we kind of sat around and said, what can we do differently uh, to make sure that small businesses have a chance, have a seat at the table? We're a membership-based organization. Our dues are, you know, usually nine hundred to fifteen hundred dollars um, for uh, for small businesses. Much more if you're a hotel, a different formula. But there was an opportunity for us to 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 really work with those organizations that would find out that we're membership-based and say, well, we don't have the financial wherewithal to pay the dues, and or to attract businesses that may not have looked at us before to get them to understand who we are and what we do, how we're different from other organizations. So the DEI fellowship was an opportunity for us to work with um, local organizations. We started um, basically promoting the fact that at no cost, you can be a member of Destination DC uh, and be exposed to the meetings in which we're attracting to the city and the events that we're attracting to the city. But in addition to that, we're going to work with you to understand how to get a return on investment because there's nothing worse than someone joining and six months later saying, well, I joined Destination DC and nobody called. I'm like, well, that's not how it works. Um, so this was an opportunity for us to not only expose them to our marketing, but also share with them how to engage um, with meetings that are coming to the city, how to engage with other members because sometimes the best opportunity for them is to interact with other members to, to gain additional business. So um, the positive, as you heard last week from one of our members, is that they're actually doing business with groups that are coming to the city, with events that are coming to the city, and understanding how to get a piece of the pie in terms of the $8 billion that's being generated by visitors coming to Washington. So I think we are in, this is our second year, we're going into our third year of the DEI fellowship the goal is for them to see the return on investment and then eventually start paying dues uh, and then give us feedback along the way. So we do a lot of programs to, to engage them as we go about doing that. Uh, with CBE spending, um, you know, I know that we, as we got the tourism recovery district dollars, before we, we received these dollars, we focused on CBE spending. The biggest issue for us is that mostly, most of the marketing and everything that we do in terms of spending is outward facing with the exception of of, of um, salaries. So the question was, how do we do more with local businesses of all sizes, which is something we did way before tourism recovery district dollars, but then became a priority in the legislation as it was um, worded. So our goal was $3.8 million uh, from June of um, uh, July of 2023 to June of this year. And we're up to this point, we've spent about $2.8 million of that. I'm sorry, if you can repeat those numbers. I, weren't right, I wasn't right now. I thought I might have had them in the pre-hearing responses, but I don't think I do. What, what, can you give me the numbers again, though? Sure. The goal is $3.8 million for CBE spending. And it started in July of 2023, which is 
in line with when we started receiving the actual TRD dollars. Got it. And it ends uh, the first 12 months, it ends June of 2024. And to date, we spent 2.8 million. So we're 1 million shy of reaching that goal, which we're still focusing on. And I'll um, turn it over to John to offer additional perspective. Good afternoon, Council Member McDonald. If you could say your name for the record, sure. I, I forgot to ask. Uh, My name is Ron John Kim, Kim, CFO of Destination DC. In addition to what uh, our chairman, uh, our president and CEO offered, the, the challenge of working with the CBE business has been the scope of business available to what we try to accomplish. Traditionally, pre-pandemic, uh, pre-TRD uh, world, we were spending about $250,000 to $500,000 range. As Elliot just shared, $2.8 million is a significant uh, improvement. There are additional categories of businesses that we have included since TRD was implemented, such as public relations and uh, social influencing, also the event management. Those were not necessarily part of our CB spending pre-TRD. So I just wanted to highlight that we are expanding the categories of businesses that it is available in DC area to make sure not just uh, meeting our goal, but perhaps uh, ex surpass if it's possible. Yeah, if, if you could follow up with the committee and, and, and provide that information to us and give us a breakdown of who the businesses are. Sure. I appreciate that you all are making the effort. Mm -hmm. I know historically we've talked about this and you all have found it challenging. Uh, um, so I think, I think it's something that um, is worth continued exploration, which just sounds like you all are already working on. So, Absolutely. but I'd love to see um, what that looks like on paper in terms of that spend and, and who you're spending it with. Okay. Um, in addition, as we talked about the fellowship, those new members that are coming on that are not CBE certified, mm -hmm. we're basically talking to all members of Destination DC that are not, but qualify and offering them a process to become CBE certified. Okay because part of our goal is to do business with our members. Right. So that's that adds another layer of challenge. And so there's a process in place now for us to make sure that those that are coming on board not only benefit from membership of Destination DC, but of course, the entire CBE process. Okay, thank you for that. I asked this of uh, events DC and wanted to pose the question to you all. Do you, do you all have uh, a sexual harassment officer within Destination DC? We we have uh, two individuals, um, one a talent acquisition manager and a people and culture uh, position that focus on um, this particular area. So mm -hmm. um, not a individual that specifically has that in their title, but a, a part of the curriculum for those two positions. Okay, and and then so there is a a a policy in place for uh, an individual individuals who who if felt aggrieved wanted to file a complaint. There's something that's clear that every employee knows what they can do and and what their their rights and options are. Yes. Okay. We also have an internal DEI task force um, of individuals that work for Destination DC that help us focus on on some of these issues as well. So we're we focus on it on a regular basis. Okay. Thank you for that. And do, do employees actually get trained around um, uh, this aspect of uh, the work and the workplace culture? Absolutely. Okay. There's a lot of sexual harass harassment training, DEI training um, that is mandatory. Okay. Um, how many of the, how many employees does, does uh, Destination DC have? We have 107 full-time employees at Destination DC and about 100 or so additional, 110 um, what are called red coats. Those are the individuals that work part-time that are in the convention center uh, doing registration. And, and um, so it's so a pretty, pretty large and, and team. Can you tell us how many of the full-time employees are district residents? Uh, of the 110, I believe 39 
Well, yeah. you said 107 after you. Excuse me, 107, um, 39 are, full, are district residents. Do you track those numbers for the, the, the 110 red coats? Um, we do. Um, I don't think I have it, and I'll make sure that we follow up with you. Okay. Got it. And so do you have you made any efforts to try to increase the, the D.C. resident hires? Um, how do you view that number uh, in terms of uh, 39 residents out of 107? FTs you have there? It's, you know, we, five years ago or more, we had a larger number of full-time residents um, that lived in the District of Columbia. But as you can imagine, as we're looking at the tiers of salaries, it it becomes a reoccurring issue in terms of affordability. Okay. So it, it is a priority. Right. Um, and um, we, you know, as we look at senior staff, that number is, you know, 80% of senior staff lives in the district. You, you just anticipate my next question. So how, how many senior staff do you have? Uh, we have 11. Okay. And so 80% yeah. lives in the yes. district. Um, so you talked about this in your testimony and, and there have been some mentions of it, I think, along the way of our back and forth of question and answer, but I want to look specifically at the um, the hotel tax, the increase. Let me make sure I have, is this yours? Oh, it's further back. I'm trying to find your testimony where you talked about it. Here we go. So you said that it provided uh, the tourism recovery tax provided an additional $8.9 million in FY23. Um, and that the budget is going to grow to $46 million in FY24. You probably already said this, but I think just to make sure it's clear on the record, with that additional money, what are the types of things that you're doing, if anything, that is new, like brand new? Uh, and then what are the types of things that you're doing that, you know, you, you know works and, and you're just really doubling down on or just increasing the ability to maximize the, the additional funds. Um, and is there anything that you completely just sort of ditching um, as an effort that just really hasn't returned the sort of value you want? Just, just break down what that looks like uh, in terms of your operations uh, for Destination DC. Sure, absolutely. I'll start by um, saying that um, there is a tourism recovery district committee that is comprised of the board of directors, the officers of the hotel association, and the hotel general managers on my board that offers an additional layer of oversight in addition to Ron and the board of directors at Destination DC and uh, the contract we have with Events DC. So there's a lot of oversight in terms of how we're spending the dollars. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, the lion's share of the expenditures are tied to our marketing and advertising um, goals. Um, we are the organization that focuses on bringing conventions to the convention center. I was listening to uh, Council Member uh, Henderson's questions earlier. Um, so there is there are dollars being spent in terms of being attractive for the convention market, but the lion's share of it is being spent on marketing and advertising. And in that regard, before the Tourism Recovery District, we weren't able to do any television advertising. So all the Colonial Williamsburg ads and the visit uh, um, Asheville ads that you see on a regular basis here, we weren't able to do that because we didn't, if we spent our budget on that, we would have no dollars after one or two weeks. So now we're able to do more of that advertising, especially domestically, um, which is extremely impactful. Um, internationally, I referenced the new office and the new representation in Mexico in Canada and in Brazil, which we reopened and advertising and promotions that we're doing in those particular markets with um, our VP of, of Tourism and Robin and her team uh, in terms of promoting Washington in those particular areas. We do a lot of this with the Airports Authority. Um, the Airports Authority has a budget to market the airport, but not a budget to market the destination. So they give us additional dollars to help us promote DC, which is the goal, not the airport. Um, and um, so what we're able to do is to have longer um, opportunities to promote DC in key markets, whereas we would have had to cut it off before. 
um, doing some unique marketing bus wraps um, in certain destinations. We did a, a takeover of the 30th Street Station in Philadelphia with Washington, D.C. advertising. Uh, we did uh, taxi cab wraps in the U.K. Um, these things are, um, they resonate with visitors. The studies tell us that it gets those, those that are thinking about traveling to the U.S. to think about Washington, uh, perhaps in the same vein that they think about other destinations. One of the biggest problems we have is that um, a visitor from Brazil will travel to New York um, for four or five days, and then they're sold on coming to D.C. for a day trip which means we don't have the economic impact as New York would have had with that same visitor. Um, the marketing gives them a chance to think differently. One, we're cheaper because there's so many free things to see and do. By all means, go to New York, but spend at least two or three days in Washington, D.C., because what happens is that they get here and the reaction is we had no idea D.C. had so much to offer. So if we're able to, our, through our marketing, to get them to think along those lines before they actually book their trip, then we'll see some return on investment of those visitors coming to Washington. Thank you for that. I don't have any additional questions at this time. I think there's some follow-up that we'll look forward to getting from you. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to the record before we transition to the next? One last thing sure. I did, I wanted to follow up on some of the comments that um, Council Member Henderson was making. I know she's not in the room now, but as we talk about convention business, as was referenced, um, if it's five rooms, if it's 20,000 rooms, our organization is responsible for working with those meeting planners to bring that business to the city. We're responsible for bringing the business to the convention center. Most groups are booking seven to 10 years out. We have groups confirmed in the convention center in the year 2040. Okay. The biggest issue we have right now is space availability. It's like, it's not what you book, it's what you move to book something else. Mm -hmm. So 70% occupancy in a convention center is extremely high. Okay. And that means that if someone were to call us and say, hey, we're looking at DC for April of 2025, it's probably not gonna happen simply because we don't have the availability. Right. But the key thing for us is that our booking pace looks extremely good. Um, as we're looking at some of the fraternities and sororities, of course, every single fraternity and sorority has held their annual convention in Washington. I believe Delta Sigma Theta is scheduled to come back in 2025. We're hosting a Panhellenic Council of all of the sororities and fraternities in Washington in a few months here in the city. So our efforts are across the board, corporate, um, different types of associations, and, and everything else that can potentially meet. They come through our organization unless they go directly to the hotel and are, we're responsible for bringing to bringing the, that business to the city. So 70% occupancy, um, you says, is, 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 is doing well. Do you have a goal in terms of what the, the target occupancy is for the convention center? It, it's more along the lines of how do we increase occupancy in hotels? Okay. Because the convention center is a vessel. No disrespect to the convention center. Well, no, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, but you so know, you said 70%. What, what, were you, what were you referring to? In terms of what the number of groups in each month okay, on an average that are okay. physically using the building. Okay. So, but that ties into absolutely hotel rooms. Sure. So not every group that comes to us and says, Hey, we want to meet in DC in 2029, but there are only 1200 rooms. Are we going to give them space in the convention center? Because that prohibits us from booking something larger. Right. So it's a, uh, it, you know, I moved here 20, 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and it, from Atlanta, the building in Atlanta was 900,000 square feet. Now it's 1.5 million square feet. Mm -hmm. So every city that we compete against continues to grow and expand their buildings. And I saw an article in the Washington Business Journal today about what the what events DC is doing mm -hmm. because the building is landlocked. Right. So we Absolutely. do what we do with what we have. But if we had more, we'd be able to book more in the in the city. But the reality is, we have a extremely strong occupancy in terms of bookings in the city. Mm -hmm. And the reason why groups book so far out is it so that three years out, if they waited to come to Washington, we wouldn't have availability right. unless they met right. in February or right. in December. No, I mean, I, you mentioned that the space and being landlocked in the district. Um, and, and, and hearing um, CEO uh, Gates talk about the convention center being the largest building in the district. You know, I was in Chicago last year and that convention center is massive. It's two million square feet. And I mean, I, I went to stuff, including uh, Chicago, one of the WNBA games, Suns game, and I never I never left the hotel. 
Right. I was going from place to place and we were inside the entire time. Um, and it was just, it was something to see. Um, and I came back wondering, you know, like, how do you compete? Obviously you're DC, right? But, but that only takes you so far. And I, I think sometimes right. cities like the district have a problem with resting on their laurels and expecting that people will flock here because we are DC. Um, but it is, I think, a testament to the work that you all have to do and have done in terms of marketing the city and competing with uh, places that have larger facilities, more modern facilities. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think your last comment really, I think highlights sort of a dilemma in how you even program and schedule events, conferences, and other who wanna be here but they're competing against, you know, maybe these larger conventions or conferences at the same time. So I know your task is, is a tough one. Um, I talked a lot about sports with uh, Director Gates and I, mean, I, I imagine it's, it's harder to, to, to fit in some of these sports events when you have so much else going on, conferences with lots more members, with lots more uh, rooms, being utilized in the hotels, likely to spend more money at restaurants, um, I think it just really highlights uh, the challenge that that uh, you all were presented with, and and um, you know I think also the opportunity to to keep building, uh, particularly post pandemic. So you're absolutely right. The good news is the demand is still high. Mm -hmm. You know we could be selling a lot of destinations, whereas we'd have to sell them on the destination. We don't have to do that. We have to focus on the infrastructure. You know the fact that groups can meet here. They don't need to pay for shuttle because they can walk to the convention center versus Chicago, as you referenced, whereas you can't unless you're staying at the two properties that are there. Um, and the fact that we have so many assets that are in our backyard, including human assets, you know, the former CEO of corporations, uh, heads of National Institute of Health, former and, and current that are here that we basically utilize that. We call it um, uh, connected capital in terms of promoting DC in ways in which we can bring those groups to the city. Because it, usually the interest is here, but you know there could be other variables. It's like, well, we're looking at Indianapolis. Well, we're not gonna be cheaper than Indianapolis. Right. So if, you're, if that's what you're looking for, then can we look at, can you look at DC in a year whereas you're looking at DC and Boston? Right. So, uh, and, and to your point, it's, it's not as easy as, as, uh, as it appears. Um, and it is definitely an aggressive game because everyone's going after the same customer. Great. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for your testimony, each of you, uh, this morning. Speaking of sports, um, today is National Girls and Women in Sports Day. So before we transition to our next agency, I want to just recognize uh, that we had a resolution that we passed at the council yesterday recognizing National Girls and Women in Sports Day. Uh, and again, today marks the 38th annual National Girls and Women in Sports Day. A celebration inspires girls and women to play and be active to realize their full power. And as a girl dad with two very active uh, daughters, I wanted to make sure I took the opportunity to recognize that. Thank you. Next, we have the Department of Insurance, Securities and Banking, or DSB, as it's also referred. The department regulates financial service businesses in the district by administering DC's insurance, securities, and banking laws, rules, and regulations. DSB's primary goal is to ensure residents of the District of Columbia have access to a wide choice of insurance, securities, and banking products and services, and that they are treated fairly by the companies and individuals that provide these services. DSB also uh, aims to provide a positive business climate that encourages fair and open competition and to increase the number of financial service firms conducting business in the District of Columbia. In addition, as part of its mission, DSB strives to ensure that all relevant consumer protection laws are strictly enforced. See the commissioners taking her seat. Uh, before you all get too comfortable, I want to make sure I get an opportunity to swear everybody in who's going to testify. So once you all are, are ready, uh, you can stand and raise your right hands. Do you each swear or affirm on the penalty of law that the testimony you're about to provide to the Council of the District of Columbia and this Committee on Business and Economic Development is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. It's great to see you all. Thanks for joining us. Last couple of minutes of morning. Whenever you are settled in, 
Commissioner Woods, I am happy to hear your testimony. Good morning, Chairperson McDuffie, committee members, staff, and district residents. I am Karima Woods, Commissioner of the Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking, also known as DISBY, and the department. On behalf of Mayor Muriel Bowser, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on the department's significant accomplishments during fiscal years 23 and 24 to date, and on our unwavering support of district residents and small business owners. The department regulates insurance, securities, banking, and other financial services in the District of Columbia. Our mission is threefold. First, to cultivate a regulatory environment that protects consumers and attracts and retains financial services firms to the district. Second, to empower and educate our residents on financial matters. And third, to provide financing for small businesses. We accomplish this by effectively regulating the district's financial services industry to ensure district residents have access to a wide array of financial services, products, and providers. We also work to sustain a district business climate that encourages fair and open competition. Now I'll share a little bit about how we deliver on our regulatory mandate. The department remains committed to ensuring that insurance is equitable, accessible, and affordable in the district. One of the ways we accomplish this is through our review of individual and small employer group health plans sold through DC HealthLink, which has led to $3 million in savings for district residents and employees in FY23. We are prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. And as part of these efforts, the department is completing its report on unintentional bias and in auto insurance. I'm also pleased to share that the Health Equity Fund has made significant progress awarding grants to organizations addressing healthcare disparities in the district. To date, the fund has awarded grants totaling $21.8 million to 46 district-based nonprofit organizations engaged in health and health-related activities in the district. In January of 2023, the Health Equity Committee opened its second Health Equity Fund grant opportunity focused on policy, advocacy, and systems change, awarding $12.5 million to 14 organizations in June of 2023. The third grant round is currently underway and will focus on investing in disruptive and innovative models. Another core focus and responsibility of the department is protecting consumers from fraud, scams, and unfair or illegal practices. Our Compliance and Analysis Division, our Enforcement and Consumer Protection Division, and our Securities Bureau work to fulfill these obligations. In FY23, the department participated in a multi-state investigation of Nexo Capital a cryptocurrency lending account issuer, leading to a $424,000 settlement. The department also investigated two large-scale district consumer scams, closed 769 consumer complaints, and recovered more than $1.7 million for constituents. Through outreach, communications, and public events, we get the word out about our programs and services. The department issued 21 consumer alerts in FY23 and another three in the first quarter of FY24. In addition to publishing five podcasts and participating in 14 radio and television interviews to promote resources to as many residents and small business owners as possible. Another way that DISBY fulfills its mission is by actively seeking to prevent foreclosure and assist homeowners in keeping their homes. In FY23, the Foreclosure Prevention and Mediation Program was successful in helping 137 homeowners obtain relief under the Homeowner Assistance Fund. The Foreclosure Prevention Program prevented 213 foreclosures in FY23. Our efforts resulted in saving $102.3 million in property value in FY23 
and $2.4 million in property value in the first quarter of FY24. The work of the department's student loan ombudsman continued to expand in FY23. The ombudsman led the district's collaborative effort to provide 26 workshops about the public service loan forgiveness process that reached 2,500 residents. In addition, the ombudsman's office received and responded to more than 10,000 email requests for assistance and guidance related to the student loan forgiveness program. In FY23, the ombudsman's direct assistance to district residents resulted in the discharge of over $1.2 million of student loan debt, which is a 21% increase over the prior fiscal year. From October 2021 to December 7, 2023, 4,260 district student loan borrowers received $378.2 million of forgiveness through the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Through the Department's Office of Financial Empowerment and Education, we assisted district residents in their financial journeys through innovative outreach programs. And FY 23 and 24 to date, the Bank on DC program engaged with workforce development participants, returning citizens, and community-based organizations to connect residents to safe and affordable banking products and services. Ultimately, we helped reduce the number of unbanked residents from 8% to 4%. The DC Opportunity Accounts Program is a four to one match savings program that helps qualified district residents to pay for a variety of expenses, including education, first time home purchases, small business development and retirement. Since the program began in 2019, we have empowered 790 residents to begin their savings journey and create more financial resilience and stability in their households. In FY23, 124 residents each receive $7,500 in match savings for a total of $930,000. During FY23, the DISB Financial Empowerment Center in Ward 8 worked with approximately 1,800 district residents to help build and protect assets, address financial challenges, and plan for viable financial futures. Additionally, counselors held more than 1,000 one-on-one client counseling sessions. DISB also provided financial counseling for returning citizens, and partnered with 16 organizations to host more than 70 returning citizens at our first Financial Empowerment Summit in September 2023. I encourage all residents to visit our website, disb.dc.gov, to learn more about our various programs, particularly the Earned Income Tax Credit Program, which is currently assisting residents by providing free tax preparation services for those who are eligible. Through the department's District of Columbia Business Access Capital Program, also known as DC BizCap, we provide necessary capital to district small business owners and entrepreneurs, including those who are certified business enterprises and minority and women owned. In FY23, the department provided more than $2.95 million in funding to four district small businesses in wards two, five, and six. And FY23, DC BizCap support helped create 81 jobs and provided $5.5 million in private capital to district small businesses. Since the inception of the DC BizCap program, DISB has provided more than $20.5 million in funding to 43 businesses across all eight wards. The support was, was used to help these small businesses access more than $52 million in private capital and to create or retain more than 2,100 district-based jobs. The district is one of the country's leading jurisdictions for captives, wholly owned subsidiaries providing insurance to a parent company. In FY23, the department licensed 28 captive insurance companies, including those owned by Monsanto, The Boring Company, Arm & Hammer, and Lockheed Martin. Overall, DISB has licensed more than 350 captive insurance companies. The, the performance of the department is made possible by the talented, dedicated, and hardworking professionals of DISB. 
And FY23, DISBY filled more than 27 vacancies and processed 10 hiring actions that resulted in promotions for DISBY employees. We also hired more than 40 interns through our Financial Services Academy. In closing, the, as the district continues to work towards its comeback, DISBY remains firm in our commitment to empower, protect, and advance residents and small business owners in their financial journeys. We are committed to equitable access to high quality financial services and insurance, securities, and banking. I would like to thank you, Chairperson McDuffie, and the members of the committee for your leadership and support. I appreciate the opportunity to share the many ways that DISBY fulfills its financial services mission, and I look forward to continuing to work with the committee. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to start the questions with uh, some of the testimony we heard uh, here at the committee last week uh, and follow up on some of the questions that were raised by those public witnesses at our first performance oversight hearing. Uh, our resounding theme was a concern that Travelers Insurance Company is insuring and underwriting fossil fuel projects. I'm not sure uh, if you or your team were monitoring parts of that hearing. Um, but I want to ask, does the department have any authority to restrict the decisions that Travelers makes around insuring or underwriting fossil fuel projects? And what authority does DISBY have, if any, to issue guides for banks and insurers to be mindful of climate change and carbon in intensive projects in their financial decision making? Thank you, council member, for the question. Um, and to uh, answer it directly, um, our team was monitoring the, the testimonies provided last week. We thank the climate change activists for their testimony. Um, it is an issue that we are aware of, and we have uh, tracked some of our um, other fellow um, regulators in Connecticut and New York who have issued guidances. Um, their, their guidance has been primarily directed to the domestic insurers that are um, um, uh, underwriting insurance in their particular market. Um, and here in the district, um, and we've had a lot of internal conversations about it, uh, we don't necessarily have any authority to impose underwriting restrictions or market practices on insurers that are operating outside of the district. Um, those domestic insurers here in the district, um, from our understanding, um, are not uh, underwriting fossil fuel projects, nor are they investing uh, in those projects directly. Um, with that said, climate change um, is an issue that we are adamantly aware of and an issue that we also care deeply about and are working on with our national uh, insurance regular regulators through the NIC. I appreciate that response. Um, <clears throat> one of the department's top five priorities in fiscal year 2024 is to develop and implement a flood insurance outreach plan and metrics to measure its success. Can you talk about how that work may help mitigate some of the climate change concerns that we heard from public witnesses last week? Definitely. Um, and in talking about climate change overall, one of the ways that we have really doubled down on our efforts over the last couple of years since the, the main flood event that we had, I want to say it was in 2020, um, has been to really get the word out about the importance of flood insurance and water damage coverage. Uh, we have been working actively through the DC Flood Task Force, which was established by the city administrator in 2021. We are a voting member of that task force. Um, we um, chaired one of the re residential resiliency action teams. Uh, we designed several proposals, two of which uh, we uh, are moving forward with. One is the water damage remediation insurance program, and the other is a flood awareness outreach program. Um, as it relates to our overall outreach efforts, uh, we have uh, continued to be uh, engaged in promoting flood insurance here in the district. Uh, we have um, been very active during Flood Awareness Month. Uh, we have uh, advertised on local radio, El Zol, uh, WOL, um, Hot 99.5. I also participated in uh, Good Morning Washington, ABC7. 
um, and uh, talked about the importance of flood insurance and we ran ad campaigns on metro stations. Um, I would also add that we've been engaged in the conversation around flood insurance uh, with our federal fellow state regulators um, at a national level. We participate in NIC's Climate Resiliency Task Force and the Climate uh, Risk uh, Disclosure Survey, which we have issued here in the district. Uh, so this is an issue that we're very uh, committed to, one we're passionate about, uh, and one that we wanna make sure more district residents are aware of. We've been tracking some of the data and we've seen since 2020 that there's been an 11% increase in the number of district residents that have purchased uh, flood insurance here in the district. Uh, so that's kind of what we've been doing overall related to flood insurance. Um, I don't know if, if you wanna add anything else, Sharon. Uh, I also wanna mention, we recently just launched a storm center on our website where residents can go on our website and learn more about what to do in the event of a major weather event and how to go about contacting us uh, and what ways in which we can support residents um, if they are experiencing any issues uh, related to major weather events and or flood insurance. And just any of the other witnesses, just to make sure if you offer testimony to, to state your name and position, just so the record is clear. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, did you want to offer anything? No, I didn't. Okay, okay all right. Um, you mentioned Flood Awareness Month, and I think uh, I've seen things for Flood Awareness Week in the District of Columbia. I know other jurisdictions have Flood Awareness Month. Um, and you also mentioned, and I didn't catch the last part, I don't know if you want to restate it or if you recall what you were saying around flood insurance, but the last part of your response touched on flood insurance, and it's, um, that's important for a host of reasons, given, you know, some of the floods we've seen here in the District of Columbia, Derechos, et cetera, and I, as former council member for War 5, I've had my, my share of um, experiences in different parts of War 5 with homes that um, have had really just tra tragic floods. And, and there was a recent incident along Rhode Island Avenue with uh, a, a business that lost some uh, some of its uh, pets, dogs that were their district dogs. And so it's extraordinarily important. One of the things that we did years ago, you mentioned the, the flood task force. I know we originally started one, I believe it was in 2012 or 13, shortly after I joined the council uh, and then it was reestablished, uh, I think, in 2021 after a flood, which really impacted um, different parts of the district. But I remember walking with Mayor Bowers, I believe, in parts of Edgewood mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, but one of the things we did in the law about 10 years ago was require uh, insurers to provide notice uh, around flood insurance because there was some confusion as to whether or not flood insurance was a part of any ordinary homeowner's uh, insurance that you would pay, and it is typically not. Uh, it's actually a rider that you would have to, uh, uh, endorsement you'd have to get, or rider you'd have to get on your policy. Um, and I'm just mentioning that for awareness of folks who might be at home listening. I think it's really important because I think there's still people who move to the district and in some cases are unaware um, of the potential impact um, and may not have that, that coverage on their insurance policy. So was it, I don't know if you remember what you were saying about flood insurance. Yes, and, and I would, and that's a very great point that you made. Um, and that's part of why we have been more intentional uh, about promoting flood insurance because it's not included in, in most policies um, and you do have to purchase it separately. Uh, and so we have been very active in getting the word out about um, flood insurance, the importance of it, how to go about purchasing it. We have information available on our website. We have been promoting a number of different ads. We had a Metro ad campaign that we read, ran with some of our government partners. We've been on the radio. We've been on uh, television talking about it. We've also participated, and you said flood, ins I said flood insurance awareness month, I meant week. Um, although the month of June is is kind of when we, we focus on all things flood insurance. And so we've participated in community walks in Ward 8. Um, we have participated in block parties in Southwest. 
um, promoting flood insurance. And I think the work has really paid off because oftentimes when we're at community events, people will come up to us and talk to us about our ads, talk to us about flood insurance. Um, uh, I would also say, I think you may have been referencing, I mentioned that we're launching a new storm center on our website, which uh, to my understanding is active now. And you can go on to our website and learn more information about what to do in the event of your, your home, your property contents are impacted directly uh, by a flood. Thanks for that. Um, we also heard from uh, one witness last week who requested an update on the department's first in the nation evaluation of automobile insurance for potential unintended racial bias in rate setting. Uh, and the department's pre-hearing responses to the committee, the report was expected to be released in late January. Uh, what's the status of the report's release? Is there anything you can share today about the findings or, or early lessons learned there? Um, definitely. And um, in short, uh, we are on track to um, submit the report uh, to the executive for review and then to the public for um, final release. Uh, we have been engaged uh, in a first in the nation evaluation on automobile insurance uh, for potential unintended um, racial bias uh, here in the district. Uh, this has been an ongoing continuation of um, our work around addressing equity concerns and in insurance. We worked with um, our vendor, our contractor, um, Kathy O'Neill with uh, O'Neill uh, Risk Consulting and Algorithmic Auditing, uh, an expert in the field. We've worked with her to do an in-depth analysis uh, of a data call that we issued. Uh, and since then, we have also um, taken the findings from that data and compiled it in the form of a report. Uh, we've been very transparent and deliberate uh, because this is something that has not been done before. Um, and so we have been working with those insurers that um, did respond to the data call. We have shared with them um, the findings um, to ensure that there were no confidentiality issues uh, before we released the report. And so um, we are pleased by where we are. This has been over a year's worth of work and uh, we are gonna be submitting that uh, report to the executive for review. Uh, once the executive finalizes the report, we will share it with, with the committee council member and also with the public. We'll hold a public meeting uh, where we can uh, address any questions that the public may have. Uh, and then we plan to finalize the report and develop uh, proposals to address any of the regulatory concerns in it. Okay, thank you for that response. And I wanna stick with automobile insurers uh, just for a moment. Uh, as you know, the district has continued to face um, a serious uptick in car property theft, uh, as well as armed carjackings, tragically. Um, how, how are automobile insurers responding to this phenomenon in, in your experience? Is it is it driving up costs? Are, are they removing certain theft and repair coverage from their policies? Uh, what are you hearing? What is your team seeing? If so, how do they account for the loss of some coverage in the rates that they charge consumers? And has Disby had any concerns with how these companies are responding? Um, so thank you very much for the question. Um, it's it's a topic that, that comes up, um, unfortunately, quite frequently. Um, we um, have heard uh, concerns from residents, uh, concerns that uh, we also share about some of the high uh, auto insurance premiums. We're mindful of the impact that it's having on residents, and I include myself in that category because it's impacted my rate as well. Uh, but we, we know from conversations with our, our fellow state regulators and also with the industry that um, there are a lot of different factors that are going on. Um, we, we know that um, some of those factors have been driven as a result of car thefts, uh, as a result of carjackings and vandalism that has occurred. There are other social factors coming out of the pandemic that are attributing to um, the higher increase uh, in premiums. Um, some of those factors are supply chain issues, their labor cost. Uh, a lot of cars now have high technology, and if something happens to the car and you have to repair it, 
uh, all of that is factored into the rate. Uh, in addition to what we're seeing as it relates to crime and theft here um, in the district. There's a lot um, of, of other states we're tracking. We know that this is a national issue as well. Uh, carjackings are up in about 93% uh, um, throughout the, the nation since 2019. Uh, that includes in states like Chicago and Denver and Los Angeles. Um, so I say all that to say that what we're struggling with around carjackings and vandalism is not just unique to the district's market. And so um, in, in conversations with the industry, uh, they're seeing these trends uh, nationwide. Um, and so what we do um, per our regulatory authority is ensure that any rates that are filed with our office, that they are not excessive, that they are non-discriminatory, and that they are inadequate, that they are not inadequate. Um, and so per the prior authorization um, bill that was passed, um, we have an opportunity to review the rates through a 90-day deemer and ensuring that when rates are filed, that the uh, insurers issue a 45-day notice to their policyholders uh, before the actual uh, rate is issued. And so through that process, uh, we ensure that we're evaluating the rates in a way that's fair um, and that they're actuarially justified. Um, so I say all that to say that uh, what we're seeing and hearing is a nationwide issue. It's something we're mindful of. We're having conversations with the industry and other states. We're hoping that the trends go down. Uh, we recognize that um, there are a number of factors involved and that here in the district, I know yesterday there was a big vote on the Secure DC omnibus bill, uh, the first vote on that. And I think the more measures that we put in place to ensure that we um, bring down crime, prevent crime here in the district, it will have uh, a more positive impact on the type of rates that are being issued. We're also encouraging residents to shop around. If you think your rate is too high, uh, we recommend that you shop around for a different insurer. Um, oftentimes you may find a difference in rate once you find a different um, insurance company. Uh, we also encourage residents to make sure they're aware of all of the discounts that could be applied to them, whether it's with their current insurer or a new insurer. Oftentimes um, residents may not know that through colleges, universities, wherever you went to school or even through your job or different social clubs or other affiliations, you oftentimes can get significant discounts on your auto insurance rates. And so we do encourage residents to, to take that into consideration as well. Okay. I don't know if anyone else on the team wants to, to add anything on that. Uh, recently, the executive announced that the district will receive $62 million from the U.S. Department of Treasury to support small businesses as part of the small uh, state small business credit initiative, and that $19 million will be made available through DSB. I know this has come up in oversight mm -hmm. uh, in the past, and so uh, I want to ask, how does the department plan to use that assistance? When do you anticipate making funds available to small businesses? And what types of businesses will be eligible for this sort of assistance? And then finally, uh, how does the department plan to partner with the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development to work on this? Definitely, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, I referenced in my testimony that um, the department has continued to double down on its efforts around supporting uh, district small businesses. Uh, we know that this is one of the ways in which we support the mayor's comeback plan. Um, and so throughout FY 23 and 24 to date, that effort has continued. Uh, we were pleased to have received the 2.0 version of funding from the U.S. Treasury Department at the end of FY 23. Uh, the district was allocated up to $62 million. So we received the first tranche of funding, which was about $19.8 million. Um, and out of that funding, uh, uh, about uh, I want to say 8.6 million will be going to, to DEMPED to support their venture capital program. Uh, and we have been working closely with them throughout this process. And we look forward to that effort moving forward. 
Um, the other portion of the funding, uh, we will continue our loan participation program and also our collateral support program. Uh, we are approaching it somewhat differently um, with this new um, batch of funding uh, in support of the mayor's comeback plan. And so through our loan participation program, uh, we are uh, going through an RFP process now where CDFIs will be able to bid on three separate contracts uh, for the loan participation program. Um, the first contract is focused on small business commercial real, real estate, and there's about a $5 million allocation for that. That will provide funding for the renovation, build out and down payment expenses that are associated with any acquisition or refinance of commercial pro real estate property. The second um, contract will focus on space and equipment loan program, and that will provide funding for the acquisition of equipment and also the build out of space use for business operations. And there's a total of two million that is allocated for that. And then lastly, and we've heard um, continuously from um, entrepreneurs and smaller businesses to um, find a way to um, have funding more for startup capital. And so uh, we will have a startup small business loan that is focused on providing funding for a working capital or for business operations. And that uh, is uh, about $1 million allocated for that. And so that's how we're looking at uh, breaking up the funding uh, for this first tranche. And then we have 2.6 million that will be used for our collateral support program, which is the program that we have been continually uh, administering. Uh, as it relates to our government partners, we work closely with um, DIMPED. Uh, I know Aaron Finwick on my team, who's done an incredible job of running the, the BISCAP program, um, participated along with a number of other uh, Disby staff members at the most recent um, expo that took place in Martin Luther King Library, uh, focused on retail um, with DEMPED and participated on uh, a number um, of panel discussions there. Um, in addition, we work very closely with DSLBD and also DLCP um, in working with businesses that they are working directly with and planning different workshops and, and webinars. We've been active also um, with the, the Chamber of Commerce, the DC Chamber of Commerce, um, and the um, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as well. And so this is the work that we have been engaged in and finding different ways to su support small businesses and um, that uh, will continue. As it relates to the 1.0 version, I do wanna uh, emphasize that although we have a new batch of funding, we are very much continuing um, uh, the, the funds that we have in our coffers now uh, for our collateral support program, and that is ongoing as well. The, the, the funds that, we, that I initially asked about uh, from Treasury, uh, do they permit I think you said they're using a portion of it for a loan program, access to capital. Do they permit the funds to be used in the form of a grant or, or does it require um, that they be used in the form of a loan? Um, it requires that it, it's used in the form of a loan. Um, so so no, um, it can't be used in the form of a grant. Got it. And is that what well, you would know? I'll ask them when they come before me. <laughs> <laughs> um, the department submitted its SBE spend goals uh, as well as this SB spend to the committee. In FY22, this spend goal was uh, a little over $2 million and it exceeded that spending uh, goal with CBEs. However, in FY23, this spend goal was lowered to $1.7 million and it only spent 1.4 with CBEs. So I think you achieved about 83% of your goal. Does that sound accurate? And if so, uh, talk about why the goal was lowered in 23, uh, and why did this be um, uh, not achieve success in meeting its goal? Um, to answer your question directly, um, the number is accurate as of right now, but it doesn't reflect uh, what the adjusted goal will be. And so we are waiting for um, the report to come out from DSLBD. Um, year over year, we usually have an adjusted goal, mm -hmm. um, and we also uh, exceed our goals every single year. We anticipate being able to do that as well for FY23. Um, and so um, we, we continue to prioritize um, CBEs um, through uh, our contracting. Um, uh, usually our goal is adjusted down because uh, two of our largest contracts 
uh, are with nonprofits, a housing counseling services contract, and also our um, capital area asset builders contract, and they aren't eligible for the CBE status. And so usually there is uh, a time period in which that goal is adjusted down. So we do uh, anticipate that um, the goal will be um, that we will exceed our goal for FY23. Um, and I'm looking to Ms. Purdy to see if, she, if, if we want to add anything else. Thank you. What's uh, what's uh, the, uh, the department's spin goal for FY 2024? I know it's early, and it's probably at the point where it's still just the overall spin goal based on the Green Book and the 50%. The, 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 the current spin goal is $4,734,000. And as you explained, there's an expectation that that will be reduced. Yes. And at some point when the fiscal year ends, there may be even could go up or down based on DSLBD's interactions with you all, essentially the same process that you all are going through now with them? Yes. Got it. Okay. And that has occurred year over year. All right. In December, a CNN investigation found that the largest credit union in the United States, uh, Navy Federal, and I'm quoting here, has the widest disparity in mortgage approval rates between white and black borrowers of any major lender. Close quote. The Navy Federal approved 77% of conventional home loans for white borrowers compared to 48% for black borrowers, even when income, debt, poverty value, and down payment percentage were the same. Uh, the Navy Federal locations in the district all have restricted military access, uh, I believe you have no regulatory uh, regulatory authority over Navy Federal. However, you do know uh, if Navy Federal provides home loans. Do you, can you tell us whether or not they provide home loans in D.C.? And if so, is there a way for DSB to help address any potential deceptive lending and mortgage practices that um, exist uh, at Navy Federal? Um, thank you for the question. And uh, yes, uh, we are aware of the two lawsuits that uh, Navy Federal, uh, one is a class action lawsuit regarding um, unfair and deceptive practices of uh, debit card fees, and the other is related to discriminatory practices in the mortgage loan application process for um, Blacks uh, and Latinos. Um, and so, uh, as you mentioned, we do not have any regulatory authority over Navy Federal. Uh, they are uh, regulated by the Federal National Credit Union Association. Uh, we will uh, monitor the progress of the litigation uh, as it unfolds to see if there is any larger impact on the mortgage lending and underwriting space here in the district. Uh, our mortgage examination team reviews uh, mortgage lender loan approvals, uh, denials, and adverse action notices uh, to ensure that they are adhering to the Fair Housing Act and uh, Equal Credit Opportunity Act requirements. Um, so in short, um, we aren't um, planning to take any action uh, against uh, Navy Federal because we, we don't have the authority to do so, but it is something that we are closely monitoring. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I want to ask, has Disby's unintended racial bias assessment with automobile insurers revealed anything about the dangers of automated underwriting systems? Um, the unintentional bias um, work that we've been doing is is really assessing whether or not there is any unintentional bias in the underwriting of uh, private passenger automobile insurance in the district. Um, and so because the findings haven't yet been made public, I, I can't necessarily say a whole lot at this particular time as to what we have found, um, but um, part of it is to uh, review uh, the data to see if there's any type of unintentional bias uh, in the way in which auto insurers are underwriting insurance here in the district. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. It does. To, um, to add anything else. Is there anything you can share in terms of like just there may be some people at home wondering why you even uh, have engaged in this work? What, what precipitated the department's uh, interest in looking at um, unintended racial bias? 
with automobile insurers? What, what precipitated the work um, really was uh, as a result of our diversity, equity, and inclusion working group. Okay. Um, I would say that it, back in 2020, um, we uh, put together a, an internal working group, an external working group, and um, there were a set of recommendations that were identified from those working groups. And uh, this was an area um, of focus. We also uh, had public hearings as well, and this was an area that came up um, for us to consider uh, and look at as it relates to our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, and so that's really how, how it came about. Um, and I want to take an opportunity to to commend uh, the department for the significant outreach work it's done to increase the state planning, uh, particularly in wards four, five, seven, and eight. Um, this work will continue to be a top five priority for the department, according to you all, for fiscal year 2024. Can you share some of your reflections on Disby's work in this space over the past year or so and, and why it remains one of your top five priorities? Um, so when I think about our diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion efforts across the board um, and the way in which we've identified key priority areas, uh, our subcommittees, and they've really done a great job and really kind of taken the, the work and owned it, our subcommittees have uh, identified this as an area of focus. It's also been an area of focus that we have heard from many residents that they want to hear more, they want to learn more. Um, and we've also heard that from some of our government partners. It came up extensively during the Black Home Ownership Strike Force process. And so this is really us responding to the need. Um, and so we have been actively engaged, as you've mentioned, council member, in providing uh, key information and resources to district residents uh, about estate planning, about the importance of it, uh, about starting the conversation with families uh, around their assets. Um, and so we, in this past fiscal year, we uh, developed a guide to estate planning. Um, that guide is available on our website um, if, if you're interested. Uh, that, that guide also reflects all of the work that we're doing to educate residents in that space. Uh, we have um, uh, been actively working with a senior wellness center in Ward 7. I think we heard a testimony, uh, well, we received a, a written testimony from a resident who directly benefited from the work that, that we did and who attended uh, that particular wellness center and, and learned about what we were doing to help uh, homeowners to, to stay in their homes, but more importantly, uh, to educate them about estate planning. We also um, have been involved in uh, planning forms at the Northeast Public Library in Ward 6. We have uh, held at, at least three estate planning workshops in FY23. We've held two already in FY24. Uh, we plan on holding more in the month of April for Financial Literacy Month. So this is work we're committed to, our Consumer Analysis Division under the leadership um, of Philip Edmonds. Also, he and his, some of his team members uh, have participated in moderating uh, sessions and bringing additional external partners. We partner with the mayor's office of LGBTQ affairs um, to uh, have a discussion uh, about estate planning. So this is work that we are very much uh, committed to. We've also attended the first annual Advisory Neighborhood Commission's Community Connection Day. Uh, we have participated on numerous panels uh, to really just get the word out uh, about uh, how to go about uh, approaching estate planning. Uh, oftentimes, uh, residents don't know where to start when it comes to estate planning. And so what we've tried to do is really help them to, to start that conversation and begin working towards protecting um, their family's uh, wealth and, and assets. And I don't know if any of the team members want to add anything else to that. Yeah, the only thing that I would just, add- If you is, could state your name. Yeah, right. sorry, uh, Sharon Ship, um, Deputy Commissioner. Um, yeah, just to add, this um, actually ties in with uh, the mayor's goal of homeowners preservation mm -hmm. um, and to pass on genera generational wealth um, to our uh, DC residents. Uh, so it's part of the overall work um, that uh, we're committed to doing uh, and making sure that 
um, our residents are aware of what is necessary um, in their financial journey uh, to keep wealth and to pass it on to the following uh, generation. I appreciate that. I may have to circle back with you as I think about some of the oversight we do with the Office of the Chief Financial Officer and some of the tax sale challenges that uh, residents in the District of Columbia have brought to our attention, uh, the committee's attention given our oversight. Uh, it's a serious issue, um, and I know they don't much handle policy in that agency, or looking more so at, at dollars and cents, looking at the numbers, but um, what we don't want, what I don't want, uh, I don't think any of us want, is to see particularly long-term D.C. homeowners generally, but, you know, long-term black homeowners in particular, uh, lose homes under circumstances that um are avoidable i'll just put it that way so i uh, appreciate your response to that um and and councilman sure. if i may we, we do invite you to uh join us for one of our estate planning sessions and reverse mortgage forms as well we we do have a few planned for this year i'd love to get those invitations and, and hopefully i can i can attend something definitely um does your department uh have you all identified a sexual harassment officer um, it's one part of that question, but also have, have you all received any allegations of sexual harassment in fiscal year 2023 uh, and or 2024 to date? Yes, uh, we do have a sexual harassment officer also known as the show and um, our sexual harassment officer um, is Catrice Purdy. Uh, we do not have to date um, any sexual harassment allegations that have been filed. Thank you for that. Uh, last year, the committee received testimony from AFSCME, District Council 20, uh, on a grievance that they filed related to quality step increases for their members. Uh, they expected that both sides would be able to obtain resolutions. I, I recall the testimony that we got from Ms. Danza. Is that grievance still outstanding? And what can you share, if anything, about the second grievance in FY23 filed by AFGE Local 2743? So I know that there are, and I don't, I don't have that grievance information directly in front of me, but I know that there are several uh, matters that have been evolving, um, that there's one grievance that is focused on employee discipline, um, and that there are um, uh, uh, some lawsuits that are more personnel related uh, that involve um, disputes around compensation and discipline and also uh, around hiring practices under COVID-19. Um, but, but I don't have that exact uh, information in front of me. I know that we have been uh, in conversation throughout uh, the fiscal year with the union, and this topic has come up numerous times, um, but I, I don't have that information in front of me. I'm looking to um, Ms. Purdy to see if she wants to add anything. Hello, I'm Catrice Purdy, Chief of Policy and Administration. I'll only add that the particular um, matter that you raised has been escalated into um, a lawsuit. So it's beyond the grievance process. Got it. And I, I suspect there's limited things you can share about uh, an open lawsuit. So I appreciate you mentioning that, Ms. Purdy. Um, give me one second. So I know you mentioned the, the student loan. Um, you had some aspects of your testimony that touched on that. Um, the ombudsman's office continues to do great work on behalf of district residents with student loan debt, including district government employees, as evidenced by your report spotlight with uh, a deputy mayor and a written testimony the committee received from a DCPS employee. Uh, and Disby's responses to the committee has shared that the student loan on um, Busman's position is vacant. Uh, is that still the case? And if so, when does the department anticipate hiring for that position? 
Um, that that is the case. The position um, has not been filled. We do have someone who is on staff um, who was in the student loan division who's currently serving in an acting capacity for the student loan ombudsman. Uh, we are anticipating uh, posting that position for the fair, the hiring fair that I believe is this month. Okay. All right. Do you, do you know how long it's been vacant? For half of FY23. Okay. Uh, it's been vacant. Um, I will say that although it's been vacant for a portion of FY23, um, the, the team we have in place um, have moved things forward and we have continued to be successful in responding to all of the needs of district residents. As I mentioned in our testimony, I also referenced that we responded to over 10,000 emails in FY23 and um, have adamantly worked to assist all residents who contact us um, in uh, responding to their student loan debt questions. Uh, we've also partnered with the Office of the Attorney General and the Student Borrower Protection Center in conducting a number of workshops for DC government employees, um, but also for residents um, around um, uh, forgiveness of their loans. Okay. All right. I mean, it sounds like it may have been, I, I want to, I've already acknowledged the good work that's happening. I, I, I don't want to become concerned because that position is not filled. I'd love to see the good work continue. It sounds like you're saying it is. Uh, obviously something that we'll, we'll follow up on uh, as we get to budget oversight. Um, I actually don't have any additional questions at this time. Is there anything else you'd like to add to the record before we move on to our final agency for today? Uh, definitely. Thank you again, Council Member, for the opportunity to share the performance of the Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking team. Um, I, uh, in preparing for this hearing, um, I was quite pleased by where we are with our work and how much has been done over the course of this past fiscal year. So I do want to just thank um, the, DC, the DISB employees and the work that they have accomplished in FY 23 to 24 to date. I also want to thank the mayor for her uh, outstanding leadership and her support um, of the agency and the work that she's doing here in the District of Columbia. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to, to testify today. Thank you. Uh, the final agency we're here from today is the Alcoholic Beverage and Cannabis Administration, or APCA. The mission of APCA is to support the public's health, safety, and welfare through the control and regulation of the sale and distribution of alcoholic beverages and medical cannabis in the District of Columbia. APCA conducts licensing training at adjudication, community outreach, and enforcement efforts to serve licensees, law enforcement agencies, advisory neighborhood commissions, civic associations, and the general community so that they understand and adhere to all district laws, regulations, and APCA policies. APCA also conducts regulatory and settlement agreement compliance inspections, underage drinking compliance checks, and joint investigations as needed with various district agencies such as the Metropolitan Police Department and the Fire and Emergency Medical Services Department. With that, I'm going to call up our government witnesses for this agency. I know Director Fred Musali has been present. Uh, I'm gonna swear you in though before you get too comfortable, Fred, if you don't mind. Um, good afternoon to you. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to provide to the Council of the District of Columbia and the Committee on Business and Economic Development is the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you very much. It's great to see you. Uh, look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, council member, appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson McDuffie, members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development, staff and members of the public. My name is Fred Musali and I am the director of the Alcoholic Beverage and Cannabis Administration. I am pleased to say that APCA and the Alcoholic Beverage Cannabis Control Board has made a meaningful difference over the past year as the district continues to expand its medical cannabis program and make improvements in a way that alcohol is regulated. As discussed below, the agency and the board are also focused on doing its part to improve public safety. Today, I would like to share some of the board's recent initiatives and rulemakings in FY23 and thus far in FY24. I will then discuss APCA's FY23 successes, specifically focusing on the agency's recent accomplishments in the areas of one enforcement, two licensing, 
three community outreach, and four adjudication. The board, under the leadership of Chairperson Donovan Anderson, has continued to operate effectively and efficiently in carrying out his, respons his responsibilities. The current board is particularly focused on public safety and is meeting as necessary to hear cases involving licensees that were summarily suspended for violating public safety requirements. As of January 18th, 2024, the board received three 96-hour chief of police closure licenses involving license establishments in calendar year 2024. The board is committed to ensuring that license establishments are operating in a safe manner. As part of its enforcement focus, the board also worked with the agency on a civil penalty rulemaking involving alcohol violations that made changes to the existing civil penalty schedule. The civic penalty rulemaking was deemed approved by the council on December 19th, 2023. Additionally, the board is also coordinating with APCA regarding its new enforcement responsibilities under the Medical Cannabis Program Enforcement Emergency Amendment Act of 2024. The board, working collaboratively with the council and Mayor Bowser, has made numerous improvements to the district's medical cannabis program in FY23 and FY24 to date. This included emergency rulemakings to one, expand the definition of a social equity applicant to include immediate members, family members, grandparent or sibling. Two, keep the two-year registration card free for qualifying patients and caregivers until April 4th, 2024. Three, no longer require caregivers to obtain a criminal background check. Four, implement a protest process for affected advisory neighborhood commissions and applicants to follow. And five, implement a temporary registration card with different timeframe options for non-resident qualifying patients at least 21 years of age. Of note, non-resident patients are now able to register as qualifying patients for time periods of either three days, 30 days, 90 days, 180 days, or 365 days. In addition to legislative changes, the board approved its first medical cannabis courier licensed from a social equity applicant in the district resident business um, who has a location on January 10th, 2024. The courier license was subsequently issued by our agency on January 19th, 2024. The courier license allows the holder to deliver medical cannabis to qualifying patients and caregivers in the district on behalf of licensed retailers and internet retailers. Finally, on January 31st, 2024, the board issued emergency and proposed rules regarding the issue of signage and advertising at medical cannabis license establishments. The board intends to hold a public hearing on the proposed rules in FY24 prior to sending them to the council for consideration. With regard to enforcement, APCA is proud of the efforts and accomplishments of the enforcement division this past year. The division has continued to work in the field, enforcing various alcohol and medical cannabis statutory and regulatory violations. APCA's enforcement division conducted an impressive 12,417 regulatory inspections and investigations of alcohol establishments in FY23. This significantly exceeded the agency's FY23 goal, goal of conducting at least 11,000 regulatory inspections and investigations of alcohol establishments. ABCA was also able to successfully conduct 441 compliance checks for underage drinking in FY23, which exceeded the agency's goal of 400 compliance checks. In FY23, the Enforcement Division continued to monitor and inspect the district's licensed medical cannabis cultivation centers and retailers. The agency conducted inspections of all operating medical cannabis cultivation centers and dispensaries in the district at least once a quarter, 98% of the time in FY23. This exceeded the agency's target inspection goal of 92.9% for FY23. For FY24, ABCA is pleased to announce that it received a subgrant from the district's highway safety office of $192,558.40. APSCA's portion of the subgrant is intended to help reduce underage drinking in the district, an important component of the district's Vision Zero goals, and will allow the agency to conduct an increased number of compliance checks in FY24. With regard to licensing, APCA staff did an excellent job in several areas. For example, APCA's licensing division was able to keep up with the online processing of digital medical cannabis patient registrations. In FY23, the licensing division issued 10,064 patient registrations to DC residents, and as of January 8th, 2024, has issued 1,806 patient registrations to DC residents in FY24. APCA staff also deserve credit for the quick and effective implementation of a temporary card registration process for qualifying non-resident patients that has been utilized by qualifying patients from all 50 states 
in approximately 46 countries. Of significance, APCA issued approximately 19,000 non-registration resident registrations in 23. And as of January 3rd, 2024, APCA has issued 5,848 non-resident registrations um, in, in FY24. With regard to medical cannabis facilities, in FY23, APCA's licensing division received and processed 12 career applications, 76 cultivation center applications, and 55 manufacturer license applications. Filed applications were both conditional and permanent licenses. APCA's licensing division is currently processing medical cannabis retailer and internet retailer applications from unlicensed establishments for the open application period that just recently closed here on January 29th, 2024. Um, APCA's licensing division also issued five medical cannabis delivery endorsements and four medical cannabis education towards tasting endorsements to licensed retailers. Finally, in FY23 and FY24 to date, APCA's licensing division processed and approved hundreds of Class B alcohol license renewals, as well as 178 streetery endorsements for on-premise alcohol license establishments to sell and serve alcoholic beverages on outdoor private space. Third, APCA continued to be proactive with offering community outreach and education, providing trainings and presentations at no cost to deliver accurate and timely information to the public. APCA was able to train 490 members of the public in FY23. This included APCA holding multiple information sessions in 23 and 24 for applicants regarding the various medical cannabis open application periods. APCA also conducted a recording training session with ANCs on April 27, 2023 regarding the role, their role in the medical cannabis facility application process. APCA attended 101 community meetings in FY23 on license application, enforcement, and other agency-related issues. APCA also partnered with other district agencies to offer several helpful information sessions in FY23 and FY24 to date. This included the agency holding two information sessions in FY23 with the Mayor's Office of Returning Citizens Affairs and the Department of Small and Local Business Development regarding the medical cannabis facility open application period for social equity applicants, including returning citizens. For FY24, APCA is working with the District's Department of Behavioral Health and other district agencies to hold an information session for alcohol license establishments to encourage their staff to be trained in opioid overdose prevention and have naloxone, otherwise um, often known as Narcan, on hand in, to administer in the event um, an opioid overdose occurs. Fourth, with regard to adjudication, APCA's Office of the General Counsel was highly productive in assisting the board with its adjudicatory matters and rulemaking decisions. In FY23, more than 600 board orders were written by APCA's legal staff. In FY23, the board approved 122 new or amended settlement agreements that resulted in a board order. APCA's mediation specialist also mediated 62 cases in FY23, and approximately 85% of cases mediated in FY23 were resolved with either a settlement agreement or the filing of a protest, filed protest being withdrawn. APCA's OGC also successfully worked with the board in drafting numerous rulemakings and legislation in 23 and 24 to date, covering a variety of medical cannabis and alcoholic topics. This included working with the board on rules extending the West DuPont Circle and Adams Morgan moratorium zones. Additionally, APCA's OGC worked with the board on emergency and proposed rulemaking to implement the Medical Cannabis Amendment Act of 2022, which took effect on March 22, 2023. APCA's OGC also drafted the forthcoming Comprehensive Omnibus Alcohol Bill, which APCA expects to submit to the Council later this year. Looking ahead, I would like to focus on four of the agency's ongoing initiatives for 2024. One, the upcoming Retailer and Internet Retailer Open Application Period for Social Equity Applicants. Two, Class A Liquor License Renewals. Three, 420 Medical Cannabis Sales Tax Holiday Week. And four, the proposed North Shaw Moratorium Zone. First, APCA is preparing for the upcoming open application period for social equity applicants to apply for either a medical cannabis retailer or internet retailer license. This open application period for social equity applicants begins on Friday, March 1, 2024, and ends on Tuesday, April 30th, 2024. Social equity retailer applicants with a proposed location are required to make sure that the location is more than 400 feet from another retailer, and more than 300 feet from a school or recreation center with some exceptions. Social equity applicants with a location are required to undergo a 45-day public comment period with notice to all affected ANCs. 
Social equity applicants that do not currently have a location are permitted to apply for a conditional retailer or internet retailer license during this time frame. APCA held a recorded information session yesterday, Tuesday, February 6th, to provide applicants with additional information regarding this application process. Second, APCA's Class A re retailer alcohol licenses and other Class A and Class AI internet retailer licenses are required to be renewed by April 1, 2024. This year, more than 250 Class A retailers, manufacturers, wholesalers, and Class A uh, internet license holders are due for renewal. A Class A retailer's license allows the holder to sell beer, wine, and spirits for off-premise consumption. APCA will mail renewal notices to Class A retailer and Class A uh, internet retailer licenses um, by mid-February. Once APCA receives an application from an establishment, the agency will provide the public with a 45-day public comment period. Specifically, Abrica will provide public notice by one, posting two red placards on the outside of each retail establishment, two, sending written notice to ANCs and the council, and three, publishing renewal notices on Abrica's website in the DC register. A late fee of $50 will be assessed for each day a licensee is late to renew its license, not to exceed the cost of the license. Third, one of the numerous innovative and beneficial changes made to the medical cannabis program on a permanent basis in 2023 was the creation of the 420 Medical Cannabis Sales Tax Holiday Week. This first occurred on an emergency basis in April 2022. The 420 Medical Cannabis Sales Tax Holiday Week will return this year starting on April 15th and go through April 24th. Under this initiative, the district's 6% sales tax on the sale of medical cannabis at licensed retailers is waived. ABU will continue to work with the district's Office of Tax and Revenue and licensed retailers to implement this initiative in 2024. Fourth, the board will be holding a public hearing on Thursday, February 29th at 10 a.m. on proposed rules that would create a new liquor license moratorium. The North Shaw moratorium zone for three years that would extend approximately 600 feet in all directions from 1909 9th Street Northwest. Um, some of the restrictions contained in the proposed moratorium include one, not allowing any new nightclub or multi-purpose facility licenses, two, not allowing new or amended entertainment endorsements, and three, not allowing restaurants and taverns with entertainment endorsements located outside of the moratorium zone to move into the proposed moratorium zone. Any decision by the board via proposed rulemaking to implement a new moratorium would be sent to the council for a 90-day review period. In closing, I would like to thank you for your leadership and support, as well as the hard work of the committee staff. Our agency appreciates the opportunity to share our accomplishments from FY23 and FY24 to date, and the agency's plans for FY24. We look forward to continuing to work with the committee and its staff. I would also like to thank the board and the hardworking staff at APCA. I would not be able to share the agency's accomplishments and future plans if not made for the commitment made by the board and our staff to ensure that the work gets done. This concludes my testimony. I am happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, Director. I do have some questions, um, but before I get to my questions, I wanna recognize that we've been joined by Ward 1 Council Member Brian Nadeau. Uh, she's not a member of the committee, but uh, obviously has a number of APCA licensed establishments in her ward. And so I wanna to turn to her first uh, for a round at the, give us a seven minute round. Uh, welcome, Councilmember Nado. glad you were able to join. Um, turn to you for your round. Thank you so much. I'm going to do one round of questions and then I shall get out of your hair. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Director. It's always good to hear from you and I know how hard everyone over there is working. Um, I wanna take a note to thank the ABC board for working so closely with the Ward 1 community related to the, the moratorium zone. Um, that's being implemented. And I wanted to ask, how does it normally work when there are ABC licenses pending in an area with a moratorium also pending? Sure. Um, we have, as you know, council member, we have a hearing scheduled for February 29th um, on the moratorium zone. Um, what the board can do um, after they have that hearing um, would be if they decide to um, issue emergency rules that would go in effect right away. Um, obviously, the applications that were filed before a moratorium is in effect um, can go forward. Obviously, members of the community can point out the fact that a moratorium request 
um, was pending with the board, right? Which, you know, might go to the peace order and quieter over concentration um, factors. Um, but what would the board generally will do um, after hearing from everyone is emergency rules, which, which would put a, a moratorium in place. Um, that moratorium would come to the council. Um, those rules will stay in place until the council made a decision either to approve the uh, moratorium either in whole or in part. Thank you. Um, it's a really interesting situation we're in because it's been a very long time since we instituted a new moratorium. Um, and I, um, you know, I think the board has done a good job of hearing community concerns and taking this seriously. So um, thank you for helping understand the process. I get a lot of questions about it when I'm out in community about what's next. So I'll make sure we can advise our constituents accordingly. We appreciate your input as well on this council member and working with us. We appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, could you also provide an update on APCA's plan enforcement under the Medical Cannabis Enforcement Emergency Amendment Act of 2024, or when you anticipate developing these procedures given the importance of this law? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the law you just mentioned uh, took effect on January 25th, 2024. Um, under another medical cannabis law that ties in and, and relates to it, um, enforcement could start after January 31st, 2024. Obviously, we're in the beginning of February after that date. Um, the law requires us to um, post and send a DLCP, but post to our website, a list of the unlicensed establishments that applied um, by January 29th, um, who are um, not subject to enforcement um, while their application is pending. Um, now, if it gets denied or rejected, obviously, they could be subject to enforcement. So what will happen is we will be posting that list to the website. That list has been completed. Um, I do have a draft. So that will either be out at the end of this week, early next week. And then under the law, as you know, um, we can start with written warnings. Um, and before we move on to um, fines or potentially um, cease and desist orders, and uh, so we'll be moving on to that. We have already heard from ANC commissioners and others um, with suggested establishments that they, they believe may, may not be in compliance. So, um, so we're compiling that, um, but those are, those are the steps. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, and I also wanna talk about noise complaints because I'm working on some legislation to assist and I wanna make sure I've got a sense of what might be helpful here. Um, what is the current enforcement procedure that ACLA uses for noise complaints? Sure. Um, so when we receive a noise complaint, we we go out um, and there's a couple different well, a couple different ways to go. Um, if we get a complaint from a resident, we can go into their home. If we hear the noise, it's a violation if they live in a residential zone area. Um, if they don't, that's that gets somewhat problematic. We would we'd have to involve um, DOB. Um, and so by way of example, if there's like a Beyonce song and you can hear it in a residence and it's residentially zoned, um, and it's coming from the establishment, that would be a violation, right? So, so you don't um, need a special tool. You just have to be able to hear it inside. You, you just have to, it. you have to hear it from the establishment. You don't need a special tool. And what the advantage of that is, so when you're doing a noise reading, a noise reading is pretty good if you have like just one establishment by itself or not that many mm -hmm. establishments, but let's take Adams Morgan. So if you have Adams Morgan on 18th street, when you're doing a noise reading, how are you going to tell which establishment that's coming from? Right. It's, it can be difficult. So um, a noise meters good. If only one establishment's making noise, right. Or it, but so, the human ear can tell you what you're hearing. And, right. And so if you hear, you. if you hear a song, right. It's, it, it, it makes it easier. You know, um, who's singing the, the song. Exactly. And yeah. then the settlement agreements are very helpful because a settlement agreement may say no, no noise may be emanating from the establishment, right? Or no music can emanate from the establishment. Well, that makes it really easy, right? Because right. It is or it isn't. you hear music binary. outside, it is what it is. Um, so I think, I think where the frustrations come for residents is, is, is really two areas. One is we pretty much um, deal with noise and regulate noise dealing with establishments and music. And oftentimes noise is coming from patrons, either leaving the establishment, walking out of the establishment, 
you know, walking by residences. And that obviously we, we don't have the ability to issue tickets to Yes, people. although I, I will say the mostly what I hear is about the establishments. And so I was curious because there's 100, 809 noise complaints from residents in FY23, but only two citations. What what do you, is that getting at what you're talking about? Some of the complaints are not. Under I was getting ready to the second part, which is the bigger one. There you one. go. Yeah. So okay. the bigger one, unfortunately, is in, in many, many instances, these residents are living in areas zone commercial. And when mm -hmm. you look at the, the law, the protections only apply if you're zone residential. Well, if you're in a mixed use building and the building's commercial and you're complaining, you don't have the same noise protections, right? And then we have yeah. to get DOB and do that. So that's really the number one issue. Um, and then just want to get out there. Oftentimes um, in response to noise complaints, we are asking, which we have the statutory authority to do, asking establishments to close their windows and doors, asking them to turn down their music. There may be speakers that need to move. You know, if you put a speaker out near your front door, obviously that's going to generate issues. Um, and it can be working with the establishment in terms of, in the resident, knowing that if noise goes above a certain level, the resident's going to be bothered and you can put noise limiters and other things to kind of work through those issues. Thank you very much. It's been good to catch up with you. Thank you, Chairman. Good to I see you. Appreciate Thank you, Council Member. That. Appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Nadeau. Uh, I was going to start my questions off as I as I have with the other three agencies with any public witness follow up that we got from testimony last week. Um, uh, but it sounds like uh, Council Member Nadeau tackled the question. We did have a person uh, who testified that they believe the license revocations by Africa are rarely undertaken. Uh, despite repeated public safety noise and code violations to the detriment of residents of the neighborhood. And, and you talked about noise, and, and, and I think you've addressed some of the concerns that have been raised. Councilman Nadeau asked those questions. Uh, this witness particularly testified to um, purported violations in that U Street, North Shaw, LaDroit Park uh, areas of Ward 1. So glad Councilmember Council Nadeau was able to join us. Um, and ask those questions. Another witness testified that there has been major confusion amongst AFCA personnel, the public, and cannabis stakeholders on the medical cannabis law and regulations, particularly around standing to protest and the permissible location of facilities. Uh, I know that the council worked with AFCA to rewrite the medical cannabis law a couple of years ago, and that we continue to pass emergency legislation out of necessity. Um, but I have a couple questions here. So what is APCA's perspective on whether public confusion exists when it comes to medical cannabis law and regulations and how is APCA notifying the public when emergency legislation takes effect? That's my first question. Sure, great question, council member. Um, two different points. Um, one, I, I did obviously watch um, the, the hearing last Wednesday and, and all the witnesses um, relating to our agency. Um, so I think the issue in question, I don't think there's confusion, um, but what I do think happened, um, we had our first, one of our first roll calls related to medical cannabis. We had a um, motion to dismiss parties that weren't the ANC. As you know, um, only an affected ANC can file a protest. And so I think there, which we had to work internally, was whether um, that motion for dismiss would be handled by the board or be handled by um, our hearing agent. So we were able to we were able to work that issue um, at the first roll call, but I think there was just confusion in terms of who would be ruling on that motion. So to your second point um, in getting out the law, we've had um, a number of webinars, including yesterday. Um, yesterday we talked about the um, provisions in the medical cannabis enforcement bill um, that um, allowed ANCs and the party to ask for a 30 day extension change the law to allow um, ANCs that are in a nearby ANC that are within 600 feet. Um, we've had webinars um, October, like I said, yesterday, April, August, um, had several sessions with the mayor's office returning citizens, ANCs. Um, I think if you look at the number of community meetings we've gone to um, in meeting with organizations, meeting with attorneys, um, we've been very proactive in putting things out. And I, I think that the numbers um, show that. I mean, I think the one thing to put out as it relates to the enforcement legislation, we ended up with 76 unlicensed establishments. 
that applied. So um, the week prior, we had 41 applications, and then the enforcement bill got signed, and it jumped from 41 to 76. So I think that's a, <laughs> that's that's one good example there. All right. Thank you for that. Um, in your pre-hearing responses to this committee, APCA noted that it's currently working with the district's Office of Zoning Administration and the Department of Buildings to clarify where licensed medical cannabis manufacturer can locate. Uh, have there been any updates since APCA submitted its responses to this committee pre-hearing on if additional legislation will be necessary? Um, great question, council member. Um, so as you may know, one of the biggest issues that we need to move forward to where we want to get is, is, is updating the zoning issue of where cultivation centers and manufacturers can locate. Um, that's one of the critical aspects of the success of the program currently, um, until changes are made, which I'll talk about, um, manufacturers and cultivation centers have to be in PDR and industrial zones, um, many of which are in, you know, ward five. Um, with some in, in Ward 4 and Ward 7. So um, given the importance of this issue, um, we've been working proactively with zoning. We met with zoning um, this week. Um, they, they proposed something to us, which we think is, is, is going to be a huge help and a plus. Um, they're on board. We're on board. Um, so we hope that they will be announcing something soon. Happy to share that with the committee. Um, but um, what we're hoping for, which we think is going to happen, is there'll be um, additional locations that cultivation centers and manufacturers can locate, which is going to dramatically change things for, for the program. Um, you discussed the, the efforts the ABC board has taken to improve public safety, um, and I know we, we've talked about this. You've stated that as of January 18, 2024, the board received three 96-hour chief of police closure letters involving licensed establishments and public safety violations in 2024. Um, how, how does that compare with past years? Uh, what trends, if any, are you potentially seeing with public safety violations? Sure. Um, it's a little higher than the previous year. Um, so as you stated, we had three police closures in, Jan in calendar year January. Um, so um, I wanted, did want to point out, because I think it also ties into um, the uh, public witness you mentioned, um, we, the board did have on one of the three had a uh, evidentiary hearing last Thursday. They issued a um, board order yesterday revoking the license. So we had a police closure from January. We had an evidentiary hearing last Thursday. Based upon the facts, the board yesterday revoked the license. Um, one of those other closures um, is being uh, considered by the board today. Um, and then another one was, 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 was um, ad addressed earlier in January. Last fall, the committee sent a letter to the agency in response to uh, an article that reported that over the last five years, black owned businesses on 8th Street Northeast faced liquor license protests from the ANC or neighbors more often than other businesses. And this was a DCS article. Uh, furthermore, while black owned businesses make up less than half of businesses on 8th Street with a liquor license, DCS, WAMU reported that they account for 66% of the ANC or neighborhood protests in the last five years. Uh, the agency responded, I wanna thank you for that response, that it was not able to provide the data that the committee requested because it, and I'm quoting here, does not track race-based data related to alcohol licenses as all of its alcohol beverage license applications and protest petitions are race neutral, end quote, among other things. So uh, would the agency uh, consider working with the committee on um, you know, thinking about new data requirements that are legal to be implemented under the existing laws or whether there needs to be tweaks to the laws to allow for uh, the collection of uh, data around these areas. Additionally, the agency noted that it does not track protest data by type, i.e. peace, order and quiet, residential parking and vehicular and pedestrian safety, real property values, et cetera. But that most ANC cite all of these standards when filing a protest. 
Uh, how is it possible that almost every establishment protested would impact all of those protest categories and not just one? I know it's a, a compound question, but I know uh, you have it all in your head and you're going to give me an answer that touches on every part of that question. Absolutely, council member. Um, so a couple of things. One is, uh, yeah, we, we want to work with the committee to track this data. I think it's important for the reasons you raised in your letter to us. Um, we want we do want to track that data. We think it's important. Um, I think on the peace order and quiet, as we look at the alcohol bill, I think that's something to look at. I think, as you noted, generally the ANC's um, protest based on peace order and quiet, um, real property values, um, and parking and vehicle and pedestrian safety. In addition to tracking that data, I think it's helpful to look at, you know, if there should be any more specifics required as it relates to that. Um, clearly we wanna make sure um, from, a, from a racial equity point of view that we track and get an understanding of, of why, why businesses are being protested. Um, so happy to work with you um, in terms of on that. Um, do, wanna, do wanna highlight that um, since you're bringing the issue up, um, it is important of, of the reason why we have an expedited protest hearing for new licensees, for the reason you mentioned, if they don't feel comfortable what's being asked for them by an ANC or another group, is that we get them an expedited hearing, right? Because um, I think it's the old justice delayed, justice denied argument. Um, if if it takes too long for somebody to get open, that that kind of hinders the hinders the you know ability potentially of a business. So we want to make sure. Um, if there's not an agreement or someone feels that what they're being asked for is unreasonable, um, that they get an expedited hearing. Uh, thank you for that. Um, last year, uh, you mentioned the, the, the alcohol bill. So last year, the agency told the committee that we would expect, uh, we could expect the omnibus alcohol bill in April. Uh, I believe that's accurate. You'll let me know if that is not. Um, uh, the bill has yet to be introduced. So, so what accounts for this delay uh, and when can we expect the bill to be introduced? Um, thank you for that, council member. Um, the bill has a legal sufficiency. Um, it is going through um, the IQ legislative executive body review. We're hoping it's here very soon. Um, very soon. I, I think it took a little bit longer maybe than I thought to get through some of these issues. But um, like I said, we do have a legal sufficiency of the bill. Um, and we expect it to be dropping very, very soon. Okay. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Very, very soon is what I heard. And I think we can agree that very, very soon is not another several months. I um, agree with you. Okay. I'd like to note that the committee was happy to see uh, that its recommendation that the ABC board statute qualifications include expertise in cannabis regulations will be included in that legislation. So I wanted to just note that. Uh, the reimbursable detail program is a public safety initiative that details MPD officers to patrol the outside of on-premises establishments at uh, and at outdoor events on an overtime basis. Uh, it's a successful program by most accounts. Uh, it seems that demand or use of that program has fluctuated over time, sometimes increasing and other times decreasing. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? If so, why do you believe that is the case? Um, thank you for the question, council member. Um, I think coming out of COVID, we, things were a little slow. I think what we didn't like to see in 22, we only had 35 businesses use the program that jumped from 35 to 52, which was a big jump. Um, so I think that shows as we have more nightlife come back, um, we have more licensees using it. I think we also have had some bids that have taken advantage of the program. So even though the number is 52, you could have one bid that's getting that for multiple licensees and multiple coverage. Um, I think that's very valuable because you may have a situation where one individual licensee, maybe they can't afford it, even though um, you know we're, we're um, reimbursing the majority of it. But by allowing the licensees to pull together you know, under a bid or a main street, um, that, that kind of helps. Um have you are you aware that the safe commercial corridors program i know there's uh um some grants i think that that actually i don't know what the status of it is because it's under uh the deputy mayor for public safety and justice um 
but I'm curious as to how you see the reimbursable detail program potentially interacting with the safe commercial corridors program, if at all. I'm happy to meet with that office to find out. I don't have um, an immediate answer for you okay. on that, but I'm all happy right. to reach out to them on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the new partnerships that you mentioned uh, is a collaboration with the district's Department of Behavioral Health and others to address opioid overdose dose prevention. Try it again, opioid overdose prevention. Um, can you share a little bit more about this work? I think it is extraordinarily important given uh, the number of uh, opioid overdoses that we've seen in the District of Columbia. I know this is a, an epidemic across the country, um, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about uh, your work on this. Absolutely. So, you know, where this came about in partnering with DBH, the Mayor's Office of Nightlife and Culture and others, um, is obviously we've had a number of opioid deaths. We wanted to make sure that licensed establishments knew um, they weren't going to get in trouble um, with our agency, you know, if they had Narcan or other um, substances such that to deal with um, overdose issues. Um, I think there was, when DBH went out to some licensed establishments, I think there was some concern that they would get in trouble for APCA if they had Narcan or other um, items on, say, on site. Um, or that there was an opioid overdose on site. And given the importance of this, as you mentioned, in working with the Department of Behavioral Health, Office of Nightlife and Culture, among others, um, we thought it was important to, to, one, do a webinar on this issue, which we are, um, and then also partner with DBH, Mayors of Nightlife Culture, to have um, a nightlife meeting um, to do this, and also help DBH to distribute Narcan um, to um, these licensed establishments so that their employee, employees would have access to Narcan. Thank you for that and your work on that. The agency submitted its uh, SBE spin goals for fiscal years 22, 23, and 24. For the record, will you share the spin goals for those three fiscal years and, and the spin goal, I'm sorry, and the spin, the actual spin for FY 22? Uh, and where things are with FY23. Uh, and um, I, I know there's still some things that need to be done for FY24, but I, I'd love to hear what uh, you think accounts for the lower initial spin goal in FY2024. Sure. Um, so for FY22, our goal was $210,938.18. We um, significantly exceeded that. We spent $360,815.48. So we significantly exceeded that. For FY23, we also exceeded our goal. The goal for 23 was higher than 22. Um, it went up to $310,827.68. And we made exceeded that goal, spending $331,578.03. So, for 22 and 23, we um, exceeded the goal both years. For 24, as you mentioned, our goal is uh, a little lower, 192,097.50. Um, as you mentioned, that'll fluctuate. Um, normally, that goal will go up um, as we as we work with um, DSLBD. That'll go up, and 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 we'll I'm sure it'll be in line with um, you know what we spent in 22 and 23. Okay. Uh, what what's the agency's assessment of the uh, the new social equity definition as defined in the Medical Cannabis Amendment Act of 2022, uh, and as expanded through emergency legislation? Uh, what early insights or results has the agency seen thus far, and does the agency have any feedback to the committee on this definition? Uh, it's been a tremendous help, Council Member. Um, and I'll stop here just to say that you know your staff is incredible and helpful, and, and appreciate you. Um, the work, um, as you know, there's there's a lot of challenges with the medical cannabis program to get where we want to go, um, and your staff's been incredible. Um, this this definition um, in the bill you mentioned um, was huge. Um, we would not have gotten the number of social equity applicants without this change, right? So when you look at um, the bill, um, obviously that that you helped shepherd through your committee at least 50% of applicants have to be um, social equity applicants. And so, um, you know, we have 41 social equity um, applicant manufacturers, 53 cultivation centers, nine couriers. Um, so um, we would not have gotten well over the 50% without the bill. Okay. 
Thank you for that, and I uh, appreciate you recognizing the hard work of the team here at the committee. I certainly agree with that assessment. Um, if you could provide an update on the agency's efforts to facilitate the opening of the district's first testing lab. I know you touched on that a little earlier. I'm curious about um, the emergency legislation that the council passed in July to incentivize testing lab applications and whether or not that's proved beneficial. Uh, how many testing lab applications has the agency received in FY 2023 and FY 2024 to date? Uh, and how many businesses express interest in applying for a testing lab to date? Good question. Um, council member, uh, another legislative piece that's been helpful. So thank you for that. Um, the board has approved two conditional testing lab applications. We have a third that we've been working with. Um, one of the testing labs um, is represented that they would be open in Q2. I'm not sure, you know, if that'll happen, but I think it's exciting that um, we've been advised by a testing lab that they do, they, they, their intention is to open in Q2. Um, we'll see if that happens, but the fact that, um, that testing labs are, have a location um, and are making plans to try to open in the next several months is exciting. Thank you for that. Um, final question around um, that I've asked all the agencies that appear before the committee uh, today for performance oversight, uh, and that is, uh, does the department uh, have a sexual harassment officer identified? Uh, has it received any allegations of sexual harassment in fiscal year 2023 uh, and fiscal year 2024 to date? Um so we have not received any complaints um, in 23 or 24 to date. We do have a sexual um, harassment officer show, um, which is our administrative officer. Um, she's, she's been with us the whole time in that role. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I do not have additional questions at this moment, but uh, if we do, subsequently, we will reach out to you to get those questions answered. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to the record uh, before the committee adjourns for the day? No, I just want to thank uh, the committee and you, council member, for working with us. I appreciate it. Um, thank you very much. And thank you very much for your testimony. I want to thank all of the government witnesses who testified uh, before the Committee on Business and Economic Development uh, today. Uh, those government witnesses uh, include representatives from the Department of, actually, Events DC, Destination DC, Department of Insurance, Securities and Banking, uh, as well as the Alcohol, Beverage, and Cannabis Administration. This marks the end of today's performance oversight hearing. The committee will convene again at 9.30 a.m. on Wednesday, February 14th. Yes, that is Valentine's Day. Uh, to discuss the performance of the Office of the Chief Financial Officer, Office of Lottery and Gaming, the Department of Small and Local Business Development, and the Real Property Tax Appeals Commission. With that, uh, the time is now 1.35 p.m., and this hearing is adjourned.